the gateway to the game pregame show. Austin Pollock with Mike Monaco to my left, as always. Welcome into the final pregame show and final broadcast of Wareham Gateman Baseball here from Spillane Field of the 2013 Cape Cod Baseball League season. It's been a fun one, but all good things have to end eventually. Yeah, and it's starting to really feel that way. It's definitely starting to hit us, at least that this is the last home game. Uh, it's been a great summer, so, you know, hopefully we can close it out on a good note here and catch some more good baseball. Yeah, well, let's talk about the second to last home game. That was last night uh, against the Hyannis Harbor Hawks. 6-4 loss uh, for the Gateman, but let's talk a little about the starting pitching. It started with Fred Shepard. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad. It was more just the bats couldn't get that timely hit. I mean, they, they, they put up four runs, which really isn't, I guess when you lose 6-4, it's considered a close game. It's, it was a safe situation, the safe for Eric Eck. But, I mean, what do you take away from last night's game? It wasn't it wasn't a bad performance. It was just kind of like a game that, I mean, two teams showed up and Hyannis got the best of them. Yeah, there wasn't a time where Wareham blew it. There wasn't a big inning. There weren't. A lot of errors, really, even. Wareham didn't have any errors. Hyannis only had one. It was just kind of a, a close game throughout. The Gatemen were in it. They led 3-0 after two innings. But then from there, they just couldn't really get the runs across. The hits were still there, although seven of Wareham's 12 hits did come in the first two innings. Those middle innings against Peter Fairbanks, I think, really changed the game for Wareham offensively when Fairbanks, the Hyannis right-handed starter, just settled down and started mowing down Wareham hitters. Yeah, he was really able to just settle down after those innings. It wasn't rough. I mean, there weren't any big hits, just a lot of singles. It was just single after single after single. But, I mean, I mean, he was able to settle down, and the relief pitching did a pretty good job as well. Now, we talk about uh, – we went into yesterday's game talking about Hyannis. If Hyannis won, they want, they would win the season series against Wareham. They did, 4-2. to two. But, uh, I mean, you take it away, I think the only other – uh, season series this summer that Wareham uh, has has either tied or won was against Brewster 2-2 two to two. but I, I think they've got a chance to do it against Bourne but Bourne 20 and 21 and 1 coming into tonight's game they're good I mean you talk about the hitting it's not the hitting's nothing really special um, it, it's more um, it's really their pitching I mean they've got the third best ERA in the league with a 3.01 but they are second in hitting 2.61 they're kind of just been all over the place and it seems like Hyannis is a team that hasn't had the numbers but has found a, a, a way to win a lot of games but with Bourne they have the numbers but haven't found a way to have that winning record yeah I think Bourne is in a very interesting team they got off to that slow start 0-4 but then since that point on, they've been a 500 team, a few games better than 500. They've been a really just consistent team throughout the summer under manager Harvey Shapiro. They've turned around uh, from that tough start to start things out this summer. And, hey, they're going to the playoffs. They're a very good team. Yeah, they got that playoffs. The four seed, Wareham eliminated. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, Max Pentecost. He is the catcher uh, for the Braves from Kennesaw State, hitting 349. Uh, that's tops in the league. And now a little bit about Pentecost. Uh, I mean, he's 4 for 13 against Wareham this season. He's been able to hit the ball against these Gateman pitchers. Yeah, well, Pentecost is a stud. He has six home runs, 29 RBIs. He's just a beast. He, he's doing it, you know, not just with the power. The contact numbers are there, hitting 349. He's a guy that a ton of scouts are excited about, so he has that, too. He's got the production. He's an all-star. I mean, what more can you say about this kid? He's He's a rock in this born lineup. Yeah, he is batting third tonight. He'll be behind the plate again, hitting 349. The catcher from Kennesaw State, Max Pentecost. Now let's talk about tonight's starting pitcher, Will Corson Carr. And uh, against Chatham, in that start that was uh, last, I believe it was last Sunday or no, it'll be two weeks ago from t from tomorrow. Uh, he got that start. You know, he came in relief of Fred Shepard in that start here at home against the Anglers. Shepard didn't pitch well, but Will Corson Carr, I mean, he just shut the door. I mean, it's a weird situation. We haven't seen him pitch well out of the start. Out of the bullpen, he's been pretty good. I mean, what do you think we're going to see from him tonight in that starter's role? I, I don't think I'd delineate too, too much between starting and relieving, though. To be fair, after he came in relief against Chatham back on July 21st, 
he did say, you know, there was maybe a little bit more, or a little bit less pressure, I should say, because he came in after Fred Shepard didn't even get an out in the second inning. He gave up seven runs and recorded just three outs. So I think Corson Carr felt that there was just less pressure to deal with coming in to relief in a ball game that was already a little bit out of hand. And to his credit, though, he did pitch terrific in that outing. Six and two thirds, six hits, one walk, just one run. Charge to Corson Carr. He had two strikeouts. He pitched good. He hasn't started in a while, so we'll see what we get from Corson Carr because the last time he started was before that Chatham game on July 16th, where, as you might remember, he's against Brewster, three and two thirds, and he starts out tremendous in that ball game, mowing everybody down through the first, into the fourth inning, and then he runs into trouble. He didn't even make it out of the fourth inning, gave up four runs, two walks, three hits. It just got away quickly from him. So it'll be interesting to see what Will Corson Carr puts forth tonight, making his final start of the summer. Well, it, we, I saw him uh, recently, just not too long ago. He seems very relaxed. He doesn't really seem up too, too uptight, very laid back kind of guy. But uh, now we get to the part of our pregame show where we want to talk about two players you're excited to watch, one for Bourne, one for Wareham. What do you got? Well, we've already talked about Max Pentecost. So I'll go with a little different direction there and say Mason Robbins. He's in the number two hole tonight. He's from Southern Miss. He's hitting 273, the right fielder, batting second, as we said. Last summer, he was with Bourne, and he was an all-star. He batted 316 in 32 games in the regular season for the Braves. He's had another good summer, but just has been a little bit overshadowed by the other three all-stars that are in the Bourne lineup, hitting in that top four along with Robbins tonight in the starting lineup. So we'll see what Mason Robbins can do. We haven't seen a whole lot of him consistently playing against Wareham in the four games this summer. And then on the Wareham side, I'm going to go with Will Corson Carr because, you know, he came in having a great freshman season at Indiana. Hasn't started in a while, but his last outing was essentially a start, six and two-thirds in the one run that we mentioned. Can he give another great effort tonight? All right, and for me, I'm going to go with Bourne. I'm going to go with Tim Caputo, the shortstop from the University of Rhode Island. He's seven for his last 16, and he's seven for 16 against Wareham this season. I, his, I think it was that July 3rd game. That was at Dorant Park. Caputo entered the game with no strong bases. Then he had three in that one game. This guy is good. He's small. He can hit. He can run. He can field. He can do it all. He's like that. He's that little guy that you know, I guess a pitcher is like, oh, this guy's small. Well, what's he gonna be able to do? He can do it. He's a very good player. Again, Tim Caputo out of the University of Rhode Island. And I think for the Wareham side, I'm, I think I'm gonna go with. Um, this is a tough one. I think we're going to go with Brett Pirtle. He's got a three-game hitting streak. He's 6 for 15 during the streak. He, he's been he's been good of late, as as is Trevor Podach. Another guy I probably could have picked. Three-game hitting streak, 6 for 11, two doubles, four RBIs. But let's talk. I want to talk a little about somebody who's not in the starting lineup tonight, but it is Adam Toth. Adam Toth is 6 for 12 for his last 12 with four doubles and four RBIs. He was last night's player of the game. He's he's kind of flip-flopping that time in left field with Tino Lipson, but he has been very, very good recently. Yeah, he has been playing so well. It's unfortunate for Cooper Paris that, you know, he knows that he is, you know, needs to stick to alternating Lipson and Toth so he can't find a way to get Adam Toth in there because he's been playing great both offensively and defensively. All right, and here is the starting lineup tonight for the Braves. Tim Caputo leads it off. He'll be the shortstop from University of Rhode Island. Mason Robbins bats second. He's in right from Southern Mississippi. Max Pentecost bats third. He's from Kennesaw State behind the plate. Clint Freeman bats in the clamp spot. He's from East Tennessee State. He's the designated hitter. In left field from Louisville, Jeff Gardner. Mark Laird is in center field. He's from LSU. Batting seventh is the UConn third baseman, Vinny Siena. Trent Gilbert, the second baseman from Arizona, bats eighth. Tyler Caressa bats ninth. From UCSB, he's at first base. And now let's send it inside Spillane Field for tonight's national anthem and PA announcer Dan Dias.
I am Ethan Gross, and this is Wareham Gateman Baseball. I'm Tino Lipson, and this is Wareham Gateman Baseball. Hi, I'm Adam Toad, and this is Wareham Gateman Baseball. I'm Cooper Ferris, and this is Wareham Gateman Baseball. Newcomb's 3-2 hits the outside corner for strike three. Roney charging from third, goes to the backhand, makes the play. The throw on the first, pull draft the low scoop, he got him. One-two pitch, toes on the move, bolts for second, slides in safe, just ahead of the net. Call third strike, he got him, count him, that's eight Hayes for the big right-hander. Two-one pitch to Walsh, swinging a high fly ball, deep to left, that will bang off the fence. Rounding third, headed for home is Lipson, he will score. Little flare in the short left center field. Gross runs back. He makes the grab over the shoulder. Chopper back to Hoffman. Throws home to Walsh. On to first. One, two, three. Double play. And here's your broadcast team, Mike Monaco and Austin Pollock. 43 games, 56 days, and 383 innings later, it's time for the final home game of the summer. Today, the Gatemen take the field for the last time at Spillane when they square off with the Bourne Braves. Thanks for joining us on the Cape Cod Baseball Network alongside Austin Pollock. I'm Mike Monaco getting set to bring you tonight's action here in Wareham, Massachusetts. A nice 4 p.m. afternoon start on a beautiful Saturday. There were clouds in the sky earlier. Those are spreading away, and it's a good day for some baseball. The season is rapidly coming to a close, and today is the front end of a home-and-home -home series with Bourne to close out the summer. Austin, the Braves are going to the playoffs, and the Gatemen have just two games left, but all the players and coaches will tell you they want to go out on a high note. What does Wareham need to do tonight to walk away with a victory? Well, I think it starts with Will Corson Carr. He's got to be very good on the mound tonight against this Bourne lineup. They can hit. It starts with Tim Caputo. He's the shortstop from URI. He'll lead it off. Corson Carr's been very good in relief. He's had a couple of shaky starts, but we'll see what he brings tonight. I think he's going to be very good. Well, Will Corson Carr is the starter, the left-hander from Indiana. Austin, let's get the rest of the defensive alignment for the Gateman behind Corson Carr. It'll be Danny Rosenbaum at third base, Ethan Gross the shortstop, Brett Pirtle at second, Trevor Podratz at first, left to right, Tino Lipson, Cole Sturgeon, Sean McMullen, and Kyle Schwarber does the catching for Will Corson Carr. The umpires tonight behind home plate, Stephen Koneski at first base, it's Dan Henry, and at third base, Richard Galvin. As Will Corson Carr is taking his warm-up tosses, getting ready to space this Bourne lineup, which comes in at 20, 21, and 1. 41 points, that's good for fourth in the Western Division. The Braves can't improve their seeding at all. They will be the number four seed in the playoffs. Wareham, meanwhile, comes in at 9-32 and 1, trying to close out the summer on a high note, get to that double-digit win mark. They have 19 points currently, and will look to improve upon that tonight behind that left arm of Corson Carr. He's six foot four, 215 pounds from Fort Wayne, Indiana. And he just spent his freshman season with the Hoosiers. 17 appearances, 11 starts, and a 1.93 ERA. He was an all Big Ten freshman team. And his catcher, Kyle Schwarber, also with the University of Indiana. So it gotta be a little, it has to be a little more comfortable uh, for Corson Carr knowing who he's, who he's throwing to. Corson Carr this summer, five appearances, two starts, a 6.23 ERA in 17 and a third innings. Pitched in relief against Orleans on Monday night. One scoreless inning of work. He has not faced the Braves this summer, but he will face the leadoff man, Tim Caputo, the shortstop from URI. First pitch misses low, and we are underway here at Spillane Field. 383 innings. It's been a long... Long summer, that includes the preseason game. We have called a lot of baseball. Corson Carr, the tall lefty with a 1-0 count. Here's the pitch to Caputo. It's over for strike one. Caputo enters hitting at 324. He has scored 24 runs this summer. That's the most on the Braves. It's actually the most for anyone in this league not on Falmouth. Inside and low, two balls and a strike. Well, Falmouth is just ridiculous. There's a lot of good players on that team. They can hit and... What about last night? Was it 18 or 19 runs? 18 to 3 over these very Braves. 2 1, misses low and in. So Corson Carr behind in the count early to Caputo, 3 and 1. 77 degrees at first pitch. Blue skies, some big clouds. And yeah, Corson Carr misses inside and low once again. Five pitch walk to start it off to Caputo. The speedy shortstop is aboard. 
Caputo, 11 for 12, stealing bases this summer. And as we mentioned in the pregame show, back in the second matchup between these clubs, Caputo was 3 for 3, stealing bases. Those were his first three swiped bags of the summer. Corson Carr will now face the number two hitter, Mason Robbins. And the fastball runs too far inside for ball one. Robbins, the right fielder from Southern Mississippi, an all-star here last summer with Bourne. He's batting 273 this summer. 0 for 4 yesterday against Falmouth. Corson Carr will check over at Caputo, who is back easily. Robbins has 13 RBIs. Eight of them came in the last 10 games. The six-foot hitter awaits the pitch, and Corson Carr pumps a fastball on the outside edge for strike one. Robbins has had two very good seasons at Southern Mississippi. Louisville slugger freshman All-American his first year, and then in his second season, batted 317, second team Conference USA member. Corson Carr throws over to first again, trying to keep Caputo close. You can't let him, you can't let him go off and running. He'll go all over the place. Next thing you know, he'll be standing at third base. Corson Carr working from the stretch. He kicks and comes home with it. The breaking ball doesn't hook inside, two and one. Tim Caputo is that, that, that small player who, who's just very, you don't, he, he's a spark. You're surprised when he's great, when he plays so well. He's an electric player, was named an all-star for the Braves. As Robin swings over the 2-1, it's 2-2 two and two to the number two hole hitter. Tried to hold up but could not. Corson Carr looking for his first out. We're in the top of the first inning just underway. Light breeze blowing here at Spillane Field. And the pitch. Line drive out to left field. That'll fall in for a base hit. Back-to-back -back base runners aboard to start off the first inning for Bourne. Well, now you've got a dangerous hitter coming up in Max Pentecost. He's first in the league in hitting at 349. And, I, I mean, he can, he can, with one swing of the bat, he can really turn this game and give Bourne a 3 nothing lead. Pentecost also six home runs, 29 RBIs to lead the team. That's fourth most in the league. Tied for third with those six home runs. He's the big-time power bat for the Braves. Another all-star for this Bourne squad. First pitch, and that's bounced inside, blocked by Schwarber behind the dish. Pentecost is four for 13 against the Gateman this season. He was one for three yesterday with a double in RBI and a run scored against Falmouth in that 18-3 loss as Terry Thompson, the Wareham pitching coach, comes out of the dugout. Talk things over with Corson Carr who has been a little bit shaky with his control in the early going. Corson Carr, his last appearance, as we said, was against Orleans on Monday. Before that, pitched against Chatham on July 21st, came on in relief of Fred Shepard early on. It was the second inning when Corson Carr entered. The left-hander threw six and two-thirds in the length of the start, really. Six hits, a run, a walk, and two strikeouts. That was the best we had seen him all summer. Yeah, I mean, it really was, but uh, I'm really focused on right now with, with Pentecost the plate. It's it's not, when I say focused, I mean it's really, I want to see how Corson Carr can find a way to maybe get him out or get Tim Caputo, that lead runner, at second base out. We were talking with another Wareham pitcher before the game, Tucker Simpson, a right-hander, and he said he was watching Pentecost swing during batting practice, and he said he would attack him inside. See what Corson Carr does. The first pitch missed low and in that one. Stays up, Corson Carr misses, so he's behind in the count, 2-0. and oh. Hitters count for the dangerous Max Pentecost. We apologize if you're having trouble viewing the screen, maybe some technical difficulties here. 2-0. Oh. Fastball misses low, three balls and no strikes to Pentecost. We'll see if he has the green light. Reminder, throughout this game, it's the last home game of the regular season, so we'd love to hear from you. Let us know anything you'd like. Tweet at us, email us, and we'll get in touch with you. The 3-0 gets over with a fastball for strike one. You can tweet at us, at Wareham Gateman. Email us, gatemanbroadcasting at gmail.com. We'd love to hear anything you'd like to say. Runners at first and second, nobody out, and a 3-1 count to Pentecost. The pitch, that misses low. 
Another walk here in the first inning for Will Corson Carr. Bases are loaded for Bourne with nobody out and the cleanup hitter Clint Freeman, another all-star this summer, stepping to the plate. And Clint Freeman, 319 entering tonight's game. And he's played well against Wareham this season, four for 12. It's five for his last 20 though. Freeman the designated hitter today from East Tennessee State. His 16 RBIs are second most on the team. He's got a chance to add to that total right here. We're in the top of the first inning. Corson Carr from the stretch misses low and away for ball one. Born wearing these, they're, they're probably the most unique and interesting and flashy jerseys in this league in my mind. The blue based jerseys with the red and white trim. As the 1-0 line drive to left center field, that will score one. Harvey Shapiro, the born manager, will hold up Mason Robbins at third base. It's an RBI single for Clint Freeman, and Bourne is on top early, one to nothing. Yeah, I mean, four straight base runners. Corson Carr needs to find a way right now to get these guys out. Maybe get someone to hit into a, a double play because he needs outs now, and he needs them fast. No outs right now. Base is still loaded for Jeff Gardner, the left fielder from Louisville. Already one run in for the Braves, trying to get out in front of Wareham early. Fifth matchup between these teams this summer. The sixth will come tomorrow in the regular season finale as Corson Carr's slider misses low and outside. Gardner, a 270 hitter, only appeared in last night's game as a defensive substitute late. The 1 0 scoots away from Schwarber. He quickly gets to it. No movement from the base runners, it's 2-0. Gardner had quite the day last time these two teams met. Three for four with two doubles, two RBIs, scored a run and also drew a walk. He did it all in that game for the Braves as Bourne took down Wareham at Doran Park. 2-0 fastball misses again. Corson Carr struggling with the control, it's 3-0. He's in danger of walking in run number two. Corson Carr came into tonight with just six walks in 17 and a third innings. He's got two in the first inning. And misses again, a four pitch walk. And Corson Carr issues the free pass to send home another run. Born out in front two to nothing. Still nobody out in the first inning. Yeah, some, some bad command problems here as there's already some tossing in that Wareham bullpen. Kurt McCune. So with two runs already in, Kyle Schwarber will go out to talk it over with Corson Carr. The Indiana teammates, a battery here in Wareham, a battery back at school as well. Jeff Gardner at first, Clint Freeman at second, and Max Pentecost at third. The pitch to Mark Laird is over with a fastball, and Corson Carr finally finds the strike zone. Laird batting 262 since the All-Star break, however, in six games, he's just one for 20. The 0-1 misses low and away. Laird just completed his freshman campaign at LSU. He's a six foot one left-handed hitter, 172 pounds. Infield in at the corners for the Gateman, the 1-1. On the ground toward the left side, pass Rosenbaum, gross scoops will fire to first but not in time to get the speedy Mark Laird and another run in as Pentecost crosses the plate. The Braves with a quick three to nothing lead. Bases remain loaded, still nobody out. The first six run batters for Bourne have reached in this one. So it now goes to Vinny Siena, the third baseman from UConn batting 137. Horsing Carr from the stretch comes home, it stays high and it's ball one. So a shaky start for Corson Carr and Wareham as that's bounced in 2-0 as Schwarber scoops it. Mark Laird at first, Jeff Gardner at second, Clint Freeman at third base and the first three batters already home. 2-0 fastball is grooved in for strike one. Corson Carr 
in dire need of some outs. The left-hander comes set and the pitch. It runs too far inside, three and one. I mean, if, if he's in need of outs, which he is, I mean, Vinny Siena's a, good, a guy who's going to give it to. He's got two hits in his last 25 at-bats, just one extra base hit on the season. He's going to strike out a lot, 30 in 95 at-bats. 3-1 pitch. His fly ball out to right field. McMullen back a few steps, now coming in. He will throw towards second. In from third comes Freeman with a fourth run already for Bourne. Gardner tags up and moves to third. Laird stays put at first, and the Braves already have a four spot on the board. This is going to be very hard for Wareham to come back in. We don't know too much about Christian Coletti. I mean, this will be his first appearance of the season, but just based on how the bats for Wareham has been, have been this season, it's going to be tough to come down from four, come back from four runs. Coletti will be the starting pitcher for Bourne whenever this first inning is over. Just arrived in town recently, a late addition to Bourne's roster. First pitch, breaking ball, misses high to Trent Gilbert, the number eight hitter, second baseman from Arizona, hitting at 243. So after the sacrifice fly, there's one away here in the top half of the first inning. Four runs already across for the Braves, and the pitch. Fastball hits the outside corner for strike one. Strikes have been few and far between for Corson Carr here in the first. Terry Thompson very well could have to dig into the bullpen earlier than expected. 1-1 one, one fastball goes to the same spot but misses a bit outside. Well, he said before the game, he said he's focused on wins right now, not necessarily whether people are going to get their last outing of the season. They're, they want to finish strong. Can't blame them. Two games left today. Hosting Bourne tomorrow. The visitors at Doran Park against the Braves. 2-1 offering the runner off from first. Schwarber will throw. He bounced it in. He hesitated about halfway through the throw down to second. So sliding in is Mark Laird. Now two in scoring position for Trent Gilbert. Yeah, there was that hesitation. But I also think he didn't exactly throw it uh, as hard as he could. I think maybe it came out of his hand in an awkward way as well. Second and third, and a 3-1 count to Trent Gilbert with one out. The one, two, three, and four hitters all have scored for the Braves. Fastball, a called strike on the outside corner. Gilbert thought he had ball four. Well, I thought that was ball four, too, just because of the late call from Steve Kanaski, the home plate umpire. Gilbert, the batter, now faces a full count. Gilbert in his second summer with the Braves. 3-2 pitch. On the ground, back to Corson Carr. He looks the runner at third, back to the base, throws to first for the second out. Just what Corson Carr needed, a ground ball on the infield that does not score the run. Yeah, you talk about how that's exactly what he needed. He also did the smart play right there. He looked to third to make sure that the runner, Jeff Gardner, wasn't going anywhere. He has to get that lead runner. He can't give Vaughn a five-run lead right now. So the ninth batter will come to the plate for the Braves here in the first inning. It's Tyler Caressa, the first baseman from California, Santa Barbara. Breaking ball hits the outside edge for strike one. Born with an early four-to-nothing lead. The 0-1, breaking ball swung on and missed by Caressa. He's down 0-2. Caressa has one home run on the season. That came here at Spillane Field. The 4th of July, a solo shot out to right center field. Corson Carr trying to get out of the first. Here's his 0-2. Breaking ball popped up. Schwarber gives it a look. It's heading into foul ground. It will stay in play, and Schwarber puts it away. For the third out, it retires the side here in a long top of the first inning. Will Corson Carr runs into trouble, gives up four runs as the Braves have a big first inning. They lead it. Wareham coming to bat for the first time when we come back on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Back at Spillane Field after a huge top of the first inning for the Braves. Bourne taking a four to nothing lead. Will it be enough run support for Christian Coletti, the left-hander from UConn, who just signed on with Bourne? The Braves lost quite a few pitchers, and Coletti 
will be the starter today. Six foot two, 195 pounds from Rockville Center, New York. Just finished his freshman campaign with the Huskies of UConn. He made 11 appearances, nine worst starts, threw 43 innings, had a 5.86 ERA. He did struggle at sometimes with his command. 20 walks to just 29 strikeouts. He will face a Wareham lineup that has been hitting well lately, Austin. Yeah, it'll be Cole Sturgeon leading it off in center field. Brett Pirtle bats second. He's at second base. Kyle Schwarber behind the plate. Trevor Podat's in the cleanup spot. Sean McMullen bats fifth. He's in right. Danny Rosenbaum back in there. Big game for him on Thursday at Brewster. He's at third base batting. Seventh is Matt Walsh. He's the designated hitter. Tino Lipson in left field bats eighth. And Ethan Gross, the shortstop from Memphis, bats ninth. So Sturgeon to lead it off, facing Coletti, the left-hander. Comes home with the first pitch. It's over for strike one. Coletti facing a Gateman offense that has been good recently, especially this whole week, but in the last two games, 19 hits, and then last night, 12 hits. Sturgeon drives this one out to center field. Laird back a few steps, has room, makes the catch for out number one. Well, although Sturgeon did fly out there, I mean, that's good. I mean, he's able to make contact. Because Sturgeon, he's been okay against Bourne this season. I mean, he's been pretty good, four for 13. He's got two doubles. But, hey, if you're making contact early, that's always a good sign. You just got to find the gaps. So now Brett Pirtle steps in, the second baseman from Mississippi State. Switch hitter batting right-handed. Riding a three-game hitting streak. He's six for his last 15. The first pitch runs too far outside. This has a very similar feel to the last time these teams met. July 17th over at Doran Park, Bourne scored three times in the first inning. Pirtle taps that foul at the plate, one and one. The rest of the way in that ball game, the Braves got six more in the bottom of the fourth inning and went on to win 11 to four. Wareham did have 12 hits, but Bourne had 15 and really capitalized pushing those 11 runs across. Well, it wasn't a good outing for the starter, Andro Chatura. 1-1 one, one is up high. Two balls and a strike to Brett Pirtle. Gave up eight runs. Chatura pitched against Brewster earlier this week. A terrific outing for him to end his summer. 2-1 fastball hits the outside edge. Brett Pirtle, three for five. A pair of RBIs last night against Hyannis. Enters tonight hitting 250. He had the two-run single in that ball game. The 2-2. Two, two. Swung on, tipped off the catcher, Pentecost. The count stays put. Pirtle's also got a three-game hitting streak, and during that streak, he is 6 for 15. Pirtle just finished his junior season at Mississippi State. Batted cleanup for the Bulldogs right behind Hunter Renfro, who was a first-round pick by San Diego. 2-2, Two -two, that's popped up by Pirtle to the left side of the infield. Caputo racing in. He calls off Siena and makes the grab for out number two. So two quick outs to start the first start of the summer for Christian Coletti. Good way to get things rolling for the left-hander, but now he has to face Kyle Schwarber, the dangerous slugger from Indiana. Today's catcher who, in eight games with Wareham after coming over from Team USA, hitting 424. Lefty-lefty matchup, and the first pitch is popped up. In foul ground over by the Bourne dugout. Pentecost giving it a look, but it'll be the first baseman, Tyler Caressa, who makes a nice grab just in front of the fence by the Braves dugout for out number three. It's a one, two, three first inning for Christian Coletti here in his first inning on the Cape. The Braves, after one full frame, lead it four to nothing on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Cape Cod Baseball Network, it's really been a tale of two different half innings after the first. Bourne sent all nine batters to the plate, got four runs on three hits. They left runners at second and third as well. Wareham, meanwhile, goes down one, two, three against Christian Coletti. Yeah, he looked very good. Corson Carr, the left-hander for the Gateman back out, and has to do it all over again, facing the leadoff hitter for the Braves. Tim Caputo takes ball one low and in. Yeah, if, if Corson Carr's command is as bad this thing as it was last inning, we're looking at the same type of an inning. Second pitch just misses. A little bit low there to Caputo, 2-0. and In his first at-bat, Caputo walked after working the count to 3-1, and one, one of three walks in the inning. 2-0 fastball is over. It's strike one. 
Corson Carr, the big lefty from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Comes home with the 2-1. Fly ball out to left field, moving over to his right as Lipson makes the catch for out number one. Big out right there. Got to keep Caputo off the base paths. So now four in a row set down. On the hill by Will Corson Carr after the first six hitters all reached base for the Braves. The left-hander now faces Mason Robbins who had the single to the opposite field and left in the first. Fastball just misses the outside corner, it's ball one. This Bourne squad, not a prolific offense, but you wouldn't know it after the first inning. 1-0, fastball runs too far in. Bourne entering this game seventh in the league with 160 runs. Mike, we, we got to talk about Pentecost. I mean, there's something I want to say when he when he comes up to the plate, but I'll wait till then. All right, 2-0 gets over for strike one across at the knees. Got a lot of people to thank uh, today. We want to send a thank you to Al Blanchard. He organizes the meals for the players post game. Does a great job. The 2-1 just misses. Cross at the shin, so it's three balls and a strike to Robbins. Yeah, Al does a terrific job. The whole meals committee, they do a great job feeding uh, the whole team in every game and then the meals at the field as well. Corson Carr does hit the outside corner there. Looked like he was maybe a little outside, but instead the count goes full to Robbins. Yeah, I know. He, he, they've been planning a great one for uh, after this game. 3-2 pitch. Fly ball to center field. Sturgeon on the run back, still on the run. It'll get over his head and get to the fence. Robbins is up to second easily with a long double. With one down in the second inning, that is deep out to center field. 4-12 to straightaway center, and Robbins blasted that. Yeah, well, Terry Thompson on his way out right now. We don't. I don't know if that's going to be it for Corson Carr. I mean, he, he settled down, as you mentioned. He retired. He retired four straight, but... That is going to be it for Corson and Carr. It looks like the new pitcher will be Kurt McCune. We'll have everything you need to know on the right-hander when we return. So it is McCune coming in. We will step aside for a moment and come back on the Cape Cod Baseball Network with one out, a runner at second, and a 4-0 born lead. Top of the second inning and a pitching change for the Gateman. Will Corson Carr, he is already out of this ball game. Recorded four outs, gave up four runs. And Mason Robbins, the base runner at second, who just doubled, would still be charged to Corson Carr. The new pitcher, Kurt McCune, the right-hander from LSU, comes in, has to face Max Pentecost, the number three hitter. Fastball pumped in for strike one to Pentecost who walked on five pitches in the first inning and came around to score. McCune, six foot four, 180 pounds, last pitched against Katuit a few days back. One inning and he allowed three runs on three hits. Comes home with the 0-1. Hit sharply foul on the ground over by the Gateman dugout. It's 0-2 to Pentecost. McCune also pitched within this past week when he started against Chatham this past Sunday, five innings, five hits, a walk, two runs allowed. He had four strikeouts. Pretty sharp outing against that Chatham team. He looks at second, the 0-2. His weekly popped up into shallow center field. Pirtle going back. He dives, but can't make the play. Tough play there. Robbins heads up to third base, and Pentecost reaches with a bloop single with one out in the top of the second. That was a very tough play for Brett Pirtle to make. I thought Sturgeon was going to race in as fast as he could. He was running, but it was kind of more of a, a hard jog. But I thought he was going to come in and make a play. I didn't think Pirtle had a chance to hit that one. It was going to make it was going to have to be something amazing right there. Great plate coverage by Pentecost. He has an 0-2 count, just flicks his hands at that and drops it into center field. Now it's runners at the corners for Bourne. Braves already lead it four to nothing, looking for more. The cleanup hitter, Clint Freeman, digs in. McCune from the stretch comes home with a fastball that misses outside. Freeman had an RBI single to left field in the first inning. Came around to score. Middle infield at double play depth. 
Pitch misses up and away, 2-0. and oh. Braves got four in the first inning, looking for more here. Tim Caputo led it off by flying out to left field. Mason Robbins then smoked a double off of Will Corson Carr, ending his outing. And Max Pentecost just singled against McCune. Fastball cut on and missed for strike one. Good spot from McCune, low in the zone. The right-hander throws a fastball, a splitter, and a curveball slash slider. Came in with both of those as separate pitches, and now they've just kind of merged into one. The right-hander comes set, will throw to first. Pentecost dives back. It's a two and one count on Clint Freeman. Pentecost at first, Mason Robbins stands at third. Pentecost five for seven, stealing bags this summer. Here comes the 2-1. Fly ball out to left field, going down the line. Lipson giving chase, but well, that'll go foul. Saw a lot of activity in left field early in the ball game yesterday. Adam Toth was in there defensively for the Gateman, got the start, and wow, he just flashed the leather routinely out there. Made a diving catch in the second inning, another nice running, sprawling catch in the seventh inning. He's been very good out there defensively, whether he was in center field early in the season. I mean, early, early. That was before Sturgeon arrived. But back to what you were saying about Pentecost. Talk about the five stolen bases. That's pretty good for a catcher. It's a complete package. Two and two the count on Freeman. Here's the pitch. Swung on and missed, but it gets away from Schwarber. Coming home from third is Robbins. He slides and scores. The throw hits into him. And Robbins crosses the plate with the fifth run already for Bourne. Pentecost goes up to second. The runner, Clint Freeman, did go down to first base when Schwarber dropped the third strike, but he is out because there was a runner at first. So two outs, another run in, and one more in scoring position for the number five hitter, Jeff Gardner, as Bourne just continues to roll offensively. Yeah, they don't even, they're not showing sides of cooling down either. This could be a long afternoon for Gateman pitching. So McCune has the first strikeout of the night for this Wareham pitching staff. Now gets to face Gardner, who walked on four pitches his first time, then was stranded at third. Fly ball out to right field. McMullen going back. He will get under this right in front of the warning track and put it away for out number three on a deep fly ball off the bat of Jeff Gardner. So Bourne gets one more and extends its lead to five to nothing. We're through one and a half innings here at Spillane Field. We'll be right back with the bottom of the second on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Time for the bottom of the second inning on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Thanks for joining us for the final home game of the summer here at Spillane Field, beautiful field. Good day for baseball. Still some clouds in the sky, but the sun shining down. Thanks for tuning in here. I'm Mike Monaco with Austin Pollock to my right. Thanks for a great summer to all our loyal listeners out there. It's been fun. If you have anything you'd like to say here on the final home game, shoot us an email, tweet at us. You can also use the chat feature on gateman.org slash pressbox. We'd love to hear from you. It's been a great summer, a lot of fun. Can't say that enough, really. It, it truly has been. Very thankful to everybody in the organization and to our listeners. And everyone in this league, really. It's, it's just been a great time. So back to baseball. Bottom of the second inning. Christian Coletti had a 1-2-3 first. He's pitching with a 5 to nothing lead. Facing Trevor Podratz, who swings at the first pitch. A hard hit ground ball to the third baseman, Sienna, who scoops and throws for out number one. So one away for Sean McMullen as Coletti is off to a great start. Sean McMullen batting 250. He's the right fielder who just made the grab up near the warning track in right field to end the top of the second. Now comes to bat against Coletti. Lefty-lefty matchup in the first pitch. He is over across at the letters for strike one. McMullen is one for 10 against Bourne this season. Coletti got a fly out, a pop out, and a foul pop out in the first. Just got the ground out. Comes home with the second pitch. That's popped up behind us in the press box and out of play. 
So McMullen quickly in an 0-2 hole. Danny Rosenbaum due up next for the Gateman. The Louisville product gets the start at third. Here comes the 0-2. Tipped back to the screen, foul as McMullen stays alive. Wareham is at Bourne, as we mentioned, tomorrow night. Six o'clock start in the regular season finale. Coletti kicks in the 0-2. Breaking ball just misses the outside edge. Also want to thank, who else? Warren Randolph and the entire WCTV crew. They've done a great job all season producing the home games. It's also a great when Warren comes to the away games. She's been to it maybe two or three. Yeah, they've helped us out a lot. That's the one-two pitch. There's a breaking ball that stays up, two and two. I know, it's he's really been great, and we're very fortunate to have him uh, with the organization. He's been very helpful, taking care of any technical difficulties, and also just producing uh, this this great video that you're watching. Not, to, not to mention Gateman around the horn, Gateman everything. The horn. Two, two is a line drive at the first baseman, Caressa, who scoops it on the short hop, steps on the bag for out number two. The line shot off the bat of McMullen, but it turns into out number two. Also can't forget about the instant replay that he's helped bring the last few games. Yeah, fun addition down the stretch here for us. I'm sure you get to see a few more shots of that this afternoon. Oh yeah, absolutely. Some, we've had some great looks at some of the bang bang plays recently. And some great catches, you know, the one by Adam Toth yesterday. So two outs, bottom of the second, Rosenbaum the batter. He takes ball one low. Rosenbaum had a very good day on Thursday. Three for five, a home run, two RBIs. Did not play yesterday. Comes in batting 246, takes that outside, 2-0. and oh. and Willie Schwanke got the start yesterday. Most likely Schwanke tomorrow as well. Seems to be kind of rotating every other day. Rosenbaum coming on strong a bit recently. A home run, nine RBIs. He sits on the 2-0 and laces that down the left field line, and that's a foul ball just barely. Rosenbaum just realized it was foul. He thought he had extra bases. Yeah, it just kind of tailed to the left. I mean, that was the, that was a rocket. Came off his bat like it was going to be extra bases, but I guess it just missed foul off to the left. Rosenbaum with two doubles this summer. Thought he had number three right there. He blasted the home run on Thursday against Brewster out to left center field over at Stony Brook Field. Two and one the count, here's the pitch. That misses high, so it goes to three and one on Rosenbaum. I think this is the earliest start for a game we've had here other than that first game of the doubleheader against Falmouth. What was that? That was a 4.30 start, I think. The three one is a fastball down the chute. Coletti thought he had strike three there, started walking toward the dugout. It's only strike two and the count is full. Maybe it was a four o'clock start. I believe it was 4 o'clock and then 30 minutes after game one ended for, for game two. All right, so 4 o'clock. So two 4 o'clock starts this week as the 3-2 hit to the right side and into right field. A single for Danny Rosenbaum with two outs, and Wareham has its first hit of the evening. Hey, what a nice job by Rosenbaum going opposite field to that one. I mean, he continues to hit the ball well recently. He, it's With Rosenbaum, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. He'll, he'll break out and just have these these games where he goes two for three, two for four with like two doubles. And he's off to a good start today with the single to the right side between the first and second baseman. So he now stands at first. And the number seven hitter, Matt Walsh, climbs into the right-handed batter's box, the designated hitter from Franklin Pierce. Hitting 245, he was two for four yesterday against Hyannis. Coletti misses away and it gets Behind Pentecost, all the way to the screen, Rosenbaum moves up and into scoring position. It's like a pass ball there on Pentecost, just tipped out of his mitt. So now one runner out there for Matt Walsh, six RBIs this summer. We mentioned two for four last night, that broke up an 0 for nine stretch. Coletti from the stretch for the first time tonight, the pitch is cut on and missed, it's strike one. Walsh chases a high fastball. Coletti comes down to the Cape. First start today. Retires the first five batters he faces. Running into his first little bit of trouble with a runner at second. Two outs, 
in the home half of the second inning. I was talking to Matt Walsh before the game about his mustache. I asked him if he noticed Cy Sneed's mustache for high ass. He said, before I even finished talking, he said, mine's better. <laughs> Very territorial about, about people's mustaches, I think they are. Yeah, that's okay. One and one to count, the kick and the pitch. It's too far inside for ball two. Also got to talk about the players on this team. Great bunch of guys, and they really love the game. Despite the record, they continue to just come out here and grind, and they really give it all every day. Yeah, Cooper Ferris said last night that he is so proud of this group. 2-1, misses up and away. Three balls and a strike to Walsh. Yeah, and despite the record, nobody's really given up. You still see them come out here, have a lot of fun during batting practice. I mean, we heard Trey Killian come up here last night, took the headset away from me, and was having a lot of fun. I mean, they don't really think about the record. 3-1. Fly ball to center field, hit high and deep, going back is Laird, and he spins around and makes the catch. Right in front of the fence in deep center field, Matt Walsh, Blasted one, and that just kept carrying. It's out number three as Laird puts it away. Wareham strands a runner at second, and Bourne, after two full innings, leads five to nothing on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Reaching out. Kurt McEwen back out there for inning number three. He will face Mark Laird. Vinny Siena and Trent Gilbert here in the top of the third inning. Five nothing born, first pitch from McCune. Shows bunt, drops it down, roller to third. Rosemont picks it up, bare hand, throws to first, and in time. Excellent play at third by Danny Rosemont, charging in from third, and that is out number one. Wow, what a play there by Rosenbaum to take a bunt single away from Mark Laird, who has exceptional speed and laid down a pretty perfect bunt there. The only Really, complaint you could have with that from a born perspective is it was just hit too hard at Rosenbaum. What a great barehanded play. Yeah, very nice job by Rosenbaum. As Vinny Siena, first pitch swing, fouls it off to the right. Trevor Podratz gives chase, but it is out of play. Vinny Siena, a sacrifice fly to right. That was in the first inning, and he scored Clint Freeman. That was the fourth run of the inning. That one's too far inside. One and one to Vinny Siena, the third baseman from UConn. McCune has looked good so far since coming in. He's faced four batters, gave up that bloop single, but three straight outs. One, one. That's a breaking ball in there for a called strike one and two. Just a tough start for Will Corson Carr, putting his team in a tough position to come back in this one. The Gateman will need the offense to really pick it up against Coletti. One, two to Siena. That one's low and away. Ball two, two and two. Back to Corson Carr. His, his starts have been shaky, but I mean, when he comes in in relief, he's really lights out. 2-2 to Siena. That one's twisted off to the right. Trevor Podrats gives chase and foul territory over by the board and dugout and makes the catch for out number two. Podrats, I mean, if we're looking at this, this game as a little bit of a reflection on the summer, wow, he has come along so much as a fielder. I know we've mentioned it at various points throughout the summer, but he comes in here as a natural catcher, and they needed someone to play first base. And he has just stepped up and continually gotten better defensively. Yeah, I know. But when I actually first came into the season, I was looking at the roster, see who we had. I saw that Chris Schnee was listed as an infielder. I think he still is, but he's a catcher. Here is Trent Gilbert, the second baseman from Arizona, takes a ball outside, 1-0. and Yeah, I thought Chris Schnee would maybe be that person to play first base, but no, it's been Trevor Podrat. So he's also listed as an infielder. He's no. just done a great job over there. And Walsh, the only catcher. 1-0, that one is outside as well. Same spot, 2-0 to Gilbert. Gilbert grounded back to the pitcher in the first inning. That was Corson and Carr. 2-0 to count on the second baseman from Arizona. Here's the pitch from McCune. Inside part of the plate, strike one, 2-1. Two and one. You know, it's early in McCune's relief outing here, but you know, Will Corson Carr came in when Fred Shepard had a tough start back on July 21st. McCune could do the same in lieu of Corson Carr's rough outing. 2-1 as Caputo fouls that one back off the plexiglass windows of the middle school and ricochets just behind the born broadcasters up on that platform on the third base bleachers. 
And as Tucker Simpson gives a look up here and waves. 2-2. Twisted off the end of the bat, and that one is foul over by the broadcasters for Bourne as well. Tucker Simpson, a lot of fun. He was hanging up here in the press box before the game. You got to learn a lot about him, his life at the University of Florida. Tucker will be getting the start tomorrow against Bourne in the final game of the regular season. 2-2 two -two pitch from McCune. Swing and a miss, strike three. That's the second strikeout for Kurt McCune. It's a 1-2-3 inning for the right-hander from LSU. Still 5-0 born to be for the bottom of the third on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. But let's check in with Hillary Bushway. What do you got for us? Hey, Austin. Thank you. Um, I can't believe the summer is almost coming to an first game. So this happening, we're going to decide to do another trivia question for you guys. As you know, there's a huge rivalry between Wareham Gateman and the Bourne Braves. So which Wareham Gateman coach used to coach for the Bourne Braves? Go ahead and tweet your answer to us and we'll get back to you in the sixth inning. We'll send it back up to Mike and Austin for some more Wareham Gateman baseball. Thanks, guys. All right, that question again is which Wareham Gateman coach used to coach for the Bourne Braves? You can tweet your answer to us at Wareham Gateman or email us Gateman Broadcasting at gmail.com. We'll be right back on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. Down a dirty One, two, three, road. inning for Kurt McHugh. We head for the bottom of the third here on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. Tino Lipson, Ethan Gross, and Cole Sturgeon will lead it off against Christian Coletti, who has been just terrific in two innings. First pitch to Lipson is a called strike at the waist, 0-1. Lipson checks in at 277, the left fielder from UC Davis. 0-1 to Lipson is low for ball one, one and one. Big gap for Lipson in right center field as the center fielder Mark Laird is shaded a few steps over toward left. <laughs> Lipson slaps that one foul off the middle school and on top of the Wareham third base dugout and then rolls to the third baseman, Vinny Sienna. Count will be one and two. Fred Shepard, yesterday's starter, helping out with the 50-50 raffle. One and two, the count to Lipson. Here's the pitch from Coletti. Swing and a miss, strike three. That's the first strikeout for Christian Coletti, and that's how he starts things in the bottom of the third. One away for Ethan Gross. And just swings through. The high off-speed pitch from Coletti, a good pitch by him, and Lipson just couldn't handle it up in the zone. So here is Gross, checks in at 270. It's been very hot since the All-Star break, 9 for 23 since Saturday. She continues to see that average climb. It was 1 for 4 yesterday against the Harbor Hawks. First pitch is high for ball one. He's one of the guys in that last matchup against Bourne on the 17th, who had a good ball game. He was two for four, scored a run, drove one in. Wareham had a lot of hits, but only four runs. 1-0 to Gross, He's, he swings through that one for a strike one, one and one. One out on the lips and strikeout. 1-1 one, one to Gross as he swings again and misses one and two. We understand we're having some problems with the quality of our video feed, so hope to get that figured out, so please bear with us. Sorry for that inconvenience. No, it's not pretty to look at. 1-2 to Gross. That one's high. Count will even up at 2-2. Two two. Cole Sturgeon waits on deck. Tucker Simpson have a lot of fun down there. 2-2 two two to Gross. That one's outside. Full count, 3-2. and two. Works the count all the way back from being down one and two. This is what Cooper Ferris means when he talks about guys that just continue to grind throughout the summer. They do not mail in at bats. You gotta remember that Gross signed on is with a temporary contract. Three two, swing and a miss, strike three. Back to back strikeouts for Christian Coletti, two away in the bottom of the third. Nasty breaking ball there, dipping low in the zone and Gross just swings over it. Coletti has been really good throughout this outing, but especially here in the third inning as he starts to, to tally some strikeouts. Here is Cole Sturgeon, the leadoff man, flew out to center in the first inning. First pitch swing, it's a strike, 0-1 to Sturgeon. 
Yeah, Sturgeon, another guy who's been struggling, but Cooper Ferris always talks about how he's a tough kid and he's always out here grinding, always working hard. Yeah, he's hit some hard hit balls, but two for his last 21 now. Oh, one, that's a called strike, 0-2, oh, and, and Christian Coletti just one strike away from striking out the side. Sturgeon calls time, he'll step out. Outfield is pretty much straight away. Pitch, and that one is into right field. The base hit for Cole Sturgeon just over the glove of a diving Trent Gilbert. So a two-out single for Cole Sturgeon, first time he's been on today. Just sneaks it by Gilbert, who went to the dive. Didn't have a whole lot of time to move his feet before laying out. Sturgeon just reaches out and pulls it into right field for the two-out base hit. That'll bring out Brett Pirtle. Popped out to short in the first. Interesting. Pirtle batting from the left side here against the lefty. He batted right-handed his first time up. And maybe he thought he didn't get a good look. First pitch breaking ball in there, a called strike. Well, earlier in the summer, when he knew he was facing a left-handed pitcher, he took batting practice, did not feel entirely comfortable, and actually entertained the notion of batting left-handed against the lefty, though he did not do it. This is the first time he's done so this summer. Pirtle, that one is caught, and it's fair by the first baseman, Tyler Caressa. Great play, just dove out and had basically had his stomach right on that first base bag, and the ball just went right into his glove. But that is out number three, a hit, but it goes to waste. Still 5 nothing born as we head for inning number four on the Cape Cod Base Valley Network and WCTV. Four sitting here, it's Balloon Field, 5 nothing born. It'll be Tyler Caressa to lead it off against Kurt McCune. And nice way for Caressa to end the bottom of the third inning. He takes called strike one. Yeah, ground ball that was hit close to the bag. He dove, and then it took a hop that spun the other way, so he had to reach back and glove it. A one, that one is in the dirt, gets away from Schwarber, one and one. Again, we apologize for the video feed right now. Some technical difficulties coming from the truck. Working to get those fixed for you. 1-1. One, one. That one is into left center. Sturgeon going out. That'll get down. Cuts it off. But a wide turn from the first baseman, Caressa. And he has a leadoff single. First a, time he's been on tonight. Beautiful swing there from Caressa. Inside out on the ball and just hits a sharp line drive into the gap. The top of the order we go, Tim Caputo, the shortstop from URI. He walked and scored in the first and flew out to left in the second. So Caressa on first. Pitch to Caputo, that one is into left center. Sturgeon coming in, but it is Lipson who makes the catch for out number one. Yeah, Caputo just got under that one a little too much. Plenty of time for Lipson to get over and make the grab. That sets up a double play possibility now for Mason Robbins. He's had a good afternoon so far. He scored twice. He singled in the first. He doubled in the second. Yeah, that was a deep double over the head of Cole Sturgeon. That was off of Will Corson Carr. First pitch from McCune is outside for ball one. So first full trip through the Bourne lineup for McCune. He's been pretty good so far. Just gave up the two hits, a bloop single, and then that single from Caressa to left center. What a pitch to Robbins. Low for ball two, two and oh. Reminder that trivia question, which current Wareham coach used to coach for the Bourne Braves? You can send us a tweet with your answer, at Wareham Gateman. You can also email us, gatemanbroadcasting at gmail.com, 2-0. As Robbins fouls that one off the catcher's gear of Kyle Schwarber just to give you your possibilities maybe you don't know who all the coaches are you have Cooper Ferris who's the manager Daryl Maxwell Ted Regan Rich Raymond Ron Polk Terry Thompson might be forgetting one but I don't think so Manny Borges runner first is off throw from Schwarber it's a good one but it's in the dirt and Gross can't make a play so that's a stolen base for Tyler Caressa just his second stolen bag of the summer. He moves up into scoring position. 
Schwarber's throw to the shortstop side of second base. Three and one, the count to Mason Robbins, running in scoring position now, Caressa. Here's the pitch from McHugh. Foul back right by us. Bourne came in ninth in the league with 39 stolen bases. Wareham is 10th, but the Braves already with two swiped bags early on in this one. Yeah, well, they know that Wareham catchers have struggled to throw out runners, so they're not afraid. They're going to test it. Harvey Shapiro doing his best Mike Roberts impression. Roberts likes to steal. He's the manager for Katuit. 3-2 the count to Robbins. Here's the pitch. Foul back behind us. We'll do it again. Still 3-2. Yeah, just overall this summer, there have been a lot of stolen bases. Last year, in the regular season, the 10 teams totaled 488 steals. This year, with a few games left, it's already at 576. Teams are just running more this summer without all the home runs from last year. So how are you going to have to score runs? 3-2 for McCune. Foul back right at us. Well, if you can't if you can't score runs with the power with the bat with the long ball, you got to play small ball, and that's what teams have done. Yeah, that we've really seen that throughout the summer. Teams just trying to to find different ways to get runs across, and there have been a lot of lower scoring games since last year. Runner at second, Caressa, one out. Three, two pitch to Robbins. Inside corner, called strike three. Robbins disagrees, but that's strikeout number three for Kurt McHugh, and there's two away. He just comes inside with the fastball after working away on the past few pitches to Robbins. That's a great choice to come inside just to catch him a little off guard and tie him up. He gets frozen for strike three. Yeah, you're, you said this earlier. He's looked good, and he really has. Here is Max Pentecost. He's been on twice. He walked in the first and scored as Terry Thompson will make his way out to talk with Kyle Schwarber and Kurt McHugh, maybe try to strategize a way to get Pentecost out here. I don't think there's really anybody warming. Someone's walking back and forth, but that doesn't really mean anything. Got to find a way to get Pentecost, the power hitter, out here. As I said, walked and scored in the first, singled in the second. He was stranded. Yeah, we haven't really been able to, to see him in a situation where he can really display his full skill set. In the first at-bat, it was 3-0. and Then he took a fastball and then got walked on the next pitch. Second time up, he was down 0-2 early and then just kind of had to, to protect the plate and bloop in a single. McHugh with a look at second. Another look. Now he goes home. First pitch is a breaking ball just on the outside part of the plate for strike one. Pentecost checked into tonight's game or this afternoon's game at 349. That's second in the league behind Kevin Newman of Falmouth. A one, inside, one and one. Well, you wonder why Kevin Newman is so high in the batting average race. Well, he was six for six against Bourne last night when Falmouth, as a team, put together 23 hits and 18 runs against the Braves. They talk about the night for Dylan Davis. Eight, Eight. RBIs and a grand slam. Just impressive stuff in that offense. 1-1 one, one to Pentecost. Swing and a miss. That's strike two, one and two. And Kurt McCune is just one strike away from stranding the sixth sixth born runner on second base. A lot of drop to that splitter. McCune always talks about it. How much death does it have? Well, right there, that just drops off the table to Pentecost. One and two, the count to the catcher from Kennesaw State. It's a school in Georgia. One, two. Hard grounder foul, and that one hits Harvey Shapiro. Just on the ankles, he stands right back up, gets an applause from the crowd. Appears to be okay. <laughs> Pentecost looks down and nods at his manager just to make sure he's okay. Yeah, he's all he's all good. Got to you got to say something about the, cr the fans here too. They're they're great, a great bunch. And they're always, as I said, you know, Harvey Shapiro got right back up and they gave him a round of applause. Making sure he's okay as that pitch is in the dirt. Stopped by Schwarber. Count is two and two. Two and two to Pentecost. 
Runner at second is Tyler Caressa. He let off the inning. He singled and stole. Called strike three, and that is back-to-back -back strikeouts for Kurt McHugh, number four on the afternoon. He strands Tyler Caressa on second base. Still 5 nothing born as we head for the bottom of the fourth on WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Watch and listen to the Wareham Gateman on the go by loading the Ustream TV mobile app to your iPhone, Android, or Windows phone. Go to UstreamTV.com or find the link on the press box page at Gateman.org. Bottom of the fourth, five nothing more. Christian Coletti back out there for his fourth inning of work. He will face three, four, and five. Kyle Schwarber, Trevor Podratz, and Sean McMullen. Wareham with a two out single in the second, a two out single in the third, just haven't been able to string together hits against Coletti. Schwarber first pitch swing, it's a strike. Mike, it's about uh, 5.07 in the afternoon. I'm really craving a grilled cheese sandwich. How about a big thank you to Dan Dias, the PA announcer for the Wareham game. and does a great job as breaking ball to Schwarber is a little high. Absolutely. Dan has, has showed us the way up here in the press box, and, yeah, he's a top-notch chef as well. 1-1. One, one. Schwarber, uh, a high fly ball to center. Mark Laird is under it. Makes the catch for out number one. For those of you who don't know what we're referring to, Dan was featured. He was the special guest on Wareham Gateman around the, her around the horn earlier in the summer, and he filled in for the cooking segment and made a terrific sandwich. Just a little burnt. <laughs> it looked good to me. <laughs> it looked okay to me. Depends on how hungry you were it, based on how or, burnt it or was. Or how well done you like your grilled cheese sandwiches. Here is Podrats. First pitch is a called strike. Trevor grounded out to third in the second inning. But no, in all seriousness, thanks to Dan. He's, he's been great this summer. 0-1. Called strike again at the waist. Yeah, Dan's got a great sense of humor and really does a great job with the PA here at Spillane. Oh, and two, the count to Trevor Podratz. Here's the pitch. Fouls it back. What are you laughing about over there, Mike? <laughs> no, we were just reliving the sandwich. <laughs> Derek Drinkwater was the host of that show. I don't know where he is today. O2 oh, to Podratz. Our grounder to first, Tyler Caressa will take it himself for out number two. Coletti just looking sharper and sharper on the mound. Just those two singles have been the only blemishes on his evening. The guy that just has stepped right in here on the Cape and looked good. Here is Sean McMullen. Mullen, his first time up, had that hard hit ground ball at Caressa. It was a line drive that was just hit low, skimming across the ground, and Caressa scooped it up, stepped on the bag. First two, pitch to McMullen in the dirt, stopped by Pentecost. 1-0. Wareham will really need, it, not necessarily a big inning, but they will need to string together a few hits here against Coletti to get on the board. 1-0 is inside of McMullen, 2-0. McMullen from LSU, head back to the Tigers in just a few weeks. 2-0. Slapped into the left center field gap. Looking over the head of Tim Caputo, and that's a two-out base hit for Sean McMullen. Just enough to get the job done with hit number three for Wareham. Number 12, Danny Rosenbaum from Louisville. I'll bring up Danny Rosenbaum. He also has a hit. And he reached second on a pass ball. He singled just to about right center field. That was in the second inning. Continues to help that old batting average. Two outs, McMullen on first. First pitch to Rosenbaum as he swings and misses for strike one. Hefty cut there. We've seen guys 
Being aggressive in this inning against Coletti on the hill, Schwarber swung at the first pitch he saw, tried to blast one out of here. Well, on the count to Rosenbaum, the third baseman from Louisville. That one is high, one and one. Speaking of Louisville, want to thank our very own Hillary Bushway. She does a great job as the on-field reporter and social media intern. L1C4. Yeah, L1C4. Along with Jeff Gardner, the left fielder for Bourne. And he goes to Louisville. 1-1. One, one. That one's high. 2-1. and one. Yeah, So it's time to start thinking about going back to school. Crazy. You getting excited? Yeah. Uh, it hasn't really hit me yet. Yeah, it hasn't hit Because I'll have a few weeks before I go back. You haven't started packing yet? I haven't even started thinking about packing. <laughs> what about you? I haven't thought about it either. Enjoy the summer while it's here, I guess. Yeah. That's that's what I think. Still got one more game, and we're starting to think this is like the last game. It's the last home game. 2-1 to Rosebaum, swing and a miss at a pitch high, 2-2. Two and two. Wareham at Bourne tomorrow, 6 o'clock start. You can join us at 545 for the gateway to the game. 2-2 two two the count, two outs. Here's Coletti's pitch to Rosenbaum. High and away, three and two, full count. There haven't been a long, a lot of long at bats against Coletti because, for the most part, he's just been around the strike zone. He doesn't have overpowering stuff. You know, his his pitches are hittable, but a prolonged at bat here. Three two. It was foul off to the right and out of play just by the handle of the bat. Matt Walsh, the designated hitter and catcher from Franklin Pierce. Waits on deck. Three and two. Full count, two outs. Bourne leading five to nothing in the bottom of the fourth. Here's the pitch from Coletti. Swing and a miss. Strike three. That's the third strikeout for Christian Coletti. And we are through four here at Spalding Field on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Five nothing Bourne. Five nothing, born East. We head to the top of the fifth inning here at Spillane Field. I'm Mike Monaco with Austin Pollock on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Kurt McCune returns to the rubber, and will face four, five, and six due up for the Braves. As we begin the fifth frame, Bourne scored four in the top of the first, one in the second inning, and has been held scoreless since. Kurt McCune came on with one out in the second inning, allowed an inherited runner to score. Other than that, he has been good on the hill for Wareham. He will face Clint Freeman to begin things here in this inning. Freeman with an RBI single and a strikeout. Swings and misses at the first pitch. Fastball at strike one. Freeman one of five All-Stars on this Bourne squad. Three position players, two pitchers. One of those pitchers, Jaron Long, has left the squad. He signed a professional contract with the Yankees last week. Fastball runs too far inside. It's one and one. Long was the starting pitcher for the Western Division in the All-Star game. Had a .30 ERA. McCune from the windup, the 1-1. One, one. That's bounced in well in front of home plate. I think it may have actually got his foot. Actually, actually once it had hit uh, the ground. In any event, two balls and a strike to Clint Freeman. Born with a healthy lead in this one. Wareham bats, though they have a single in each of the last three innings, really have not threatened against Christian Coletti. The lanky right-hander comes home, a line drive out to right field. Freeman got jammed, but he laces it out there for his second single of the ball game, and the leadoff man is aboard for Bourne here in the fifth. Second consecutive inning where the leadoff runner, ha the leadoff hitter has reached. Tyler Caressa let off the fourth. He singled and then he stole second base. And that was it for Bourne in the fourth inning. McCune settled down, got a fly out, and then ended the top of the fourth with back-to-back -back strikeouts. Yeah, this has to be McCune's best outing so far of the season. Of course, the other one's only starts. He'll face Jeff Gardner, the left fielder from Louisville. A walk and a deep fly out to right field so far. First pitch, 
Just misses outside a little bit low. Ball one. It's 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 very McCune, It's a very interesting situation. I mean, the ERA uh, going into this one was a six a six point two zero, but he hadn't given up many walks. Just six in twenty and a third. Been just been a lot of hits. Working from the stretch, the one zero that misses low. Two balls to start it off to Gardner. McCune has been pretty reliable recently. It was a rough inning against Katuit on the 31st. Three runs allowed in that one, but his start against Chatham on Sunday, five innings, two runs. 2-0, Two -oh, and that's a fly ball lifted out to left field. That's tailing toward the line. Lipson can't get to it. It's a single as it falls in. Back-to-back -back base hits to start it here in the fifth for Bourne. Well, I don't even think Tino Lipson was going to be able to get to that one. It just kept tailing uh, to the right, closer to that left field foul line, but also have to remember Lipson might still not be Exactly 100%. Maybe like 99, but it, I mean, you got to remember he had that injury. Uh, I believe, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, it was his hamstring, but um, maybe still not 100%. Don't want to really run as hard as you can. You don't want to re aggravate it. Battled the hamstring injury throughout the middle of the season as the number six hitter, Mark Laird, squares the bunt but pulled it back. Ball one inside. Lipson missed 12 games for the Gateman. He got off to a torrid start this summer. Still one of the leading hitters. He was still named an all-star for the Gateman. He's in left field today. Runners at first and second for Mark Laird. One for two tonight. Pulls back. He was looking to hit there, but that misses high for ball two. Laird had an infield single in the first inning. And then had a beautiful bunt in the third inning, but Danny Rosenbaum, the third baseman, made a terrific barehanded play. Here comes the 2-0. Across at the knees for strike one. Andro Chatura helping out with the 50-50 raffle today. Chatura had a great start against Brewster at Stony Brook Field two games back. Good summer for the right-hander from southeastern Louisiana. As McCune looks at second, the 2-1. Laird lays down the bump, but it rolls foul. There is someone, a fan or somebody, wearing a... Red Sox Mark Bellhorn t-shirt. That's a throwback. Oh, yeah. I think I still have my Johnny Damon one, but. Johnny Damon was definitely a fan favorite. Was. Here comes the 2-2. Laird got tied up. They will appeal. And Richard Galvin, the umpire, says he did not go. The pitch came low and in. Laird thought about it but held off against his LSU teammate, Kurt McCune, so the count goes full in a battle of these Tigers. Runner at second, and a runner at first. Nobody out the pitch, and that misses low. Lair draws the walk to load the bases for Bourne here. Still nobody out in the top of the fifth. Now this inning looks a little bit more like something that uh, Will Corson Carr was going through, but Kurt McCune's been pitching very well. I mean, I think he'll find a way to get out of this one. It's the first walk issued by McCune. He now faces the number seven hitter, Vinny Siena, who had a sacrifice fly to right field and popped out in foul ground to the first baseman, Podrats. He's got the bases loaded here with nobody out. The pitch is a fastball over for strike one. McCune will be a senior next season at LSU. He's here last summer, made four starts before he had to leave with a back injury. He comes with the 0-1. Splitter that dips too low, a ball and a strike. The batter is Sienna, freshman teammate of the born starter, Christian Coletti. 1-1. Line drive into left field, base hit in from third comes Freeman. He scores. They will hold up the runners at all the bases. One run in on the RBI single by Vinny Siena. That's his eighth RBI of the summer. And the Braves have a six to nothing lead. And that's going to make Vinny Siena feel good. He's really struggled uh, all season long, but anytime you can hit it in a, a pretty good spot in the outfield and score a guy. It's going to make you feel good. You're really contributing to the team. Is now Bourne leads at 6 to nothing. Ripped that one through the hole on the left side of the infield. 
Still nobody out. The batter is Trent Gilbert. First pitch swinging. He sharply laces that one foul over by the Bat Boys. Look out, Tuck. So Sienna at first, Laird at second, good speed. And Jeff Gardner, the runner, at third. Trent Gilbert struck out his last time up. He chased a splitter low from Kurt McCune. Grounded back to the pitcher his first time up. McCune looks at second. And the 0-1. Line drive that rips foul right near the first base coaching box. So it's 0-2 on Gilbert. Kurt McCune really needs an out right now. The first four have reached for Bourne. Beautiful day here at Spillane Field. It was cloudy earlier. There was some light rain, but that has passed. A lot of blue in the sky, some white clouds out there. McCune working here with an 0-2 count, the pitch. Hit weakly to the right side of the infield. Pirtle over to his left. McCune covering the base in time for the out. But Jeff Gardner comes home from third and scores the seventh run of the evening for Bourne. Yeah, Kurt McCune running into some trouble here. The two runs in. But aside from this, he's looked pretty good. So he gets a big first out. They sacrifice the run. Mark Laird moves up to third base. Vinny Siena now stands at second. And the hitter is the number nine man, Tyler Caressa, who blasted a single into the left center field gap his last time. First pitch misses the outside edge. It's ball one as Wareham brings in the infield. Caressa his first time up popped out foul to Kyle Schwarber to end that big first inning when Bourne scored four runs. The 1-0. Strike called on the outside edge. Wareham with a seven run deficit here. The offense with three singles in this ball game but no runs to show for it. The 1-1 on the way. That's queued out to left field. That'll fall in for a base hit. In from third is Laird. Sienna being waved around. The throw will come to the plate. The tag, and he's out. Sienna gets gunned down on a nice throw by Tino Lipson in left field. Bourne does get one to make it eight to nothing, but Wareham cuts down one at the plate. Well, that's, a, that's big right there. You gotta save runs any way you can, and that's exactly what just happened right there. You, you, you've you got to save runs in this position. If, you, if your team can find a way to get the runs back and, and make what would be a very impressive comeback, then that one run could really be costly. So Caressa now the only base runner at first after his RBI single. Tim Caputo, the leadoff man, takes ball one high. Braves have extended it to eight to nothing with three runs here in the inning. McCune with two outs, facing Caputo. Last two times he has flown out to left. 1-0 on the ground to third base. Rosenbaum will have to hurry. Caputo with good wheels, but he is out at first base. A strong throw across the diamond by Rosenbaum to retire this side. But the Braves get three more and extend their lead to eight to nothing here. At Spillane Field, we are through four and a half. We'll be right back with the bottom of the fifth inning on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Matt Walsh will lead it off for the game in against Christian Coletti, born left-hander. It's eight to nothing. The Braves lead it after tacking on three more in the last half inning. Bottom of the fifth. Walsh, Lipson, and Gross. Seven, eight, nine, due up for the Gateman. Coletti just three hits allowed in this ball game. Comes home with the first pitch on the outside edge for strike one to Walsh. Flew out to deep center field his first time. That ended the second inning. Wareham trying to get on the board. On the ground to the left side, Sienna scoops it up, lasers it across the diamond for out number one. That's how we started as Coletti just continues to keep rolling. Yeah, he really has. I mean, he's got the single to Sturgeon, the single for McMahon, the single for Rosemont, just the three hits. He's been very, he's been really good today. Came in not knowing a whole lot about him. Still don't really know that much about him. There's, We know he's been good today. He has been good. He had an 
Up and down freshman season at UConn. Nine starts and a 5.86 ERA, but pitching a beautiful outing tonight as Lipson singles to the left side into the hole between short and third. He's got a one-out base hit, just the fourth hit of the night for the Gateman. Yeah, well, it's good to see Tino Lipson back there. He had a very, very good start to the season, when, and then when he got hurt, and then he came back, and he was very good. And then he had been hitting in every game he's played, and then he kind of went into a slump, and... I mean, then it was time. It was like, okay, time to let's let's start working on a way to get Adam Toth in there as well. But uh, yeah, he's been pretty quiet. Two for his last eight with a double and a run and a two runs scored. But and Lipson off. They'll throw over to first. Caressa to second. Lipson slides in, but he is out as Caputo applies the tag. So that is quickly erased. Another base running blunder. We saw this late in the ball game last night with two Wareham guys. One a pick off one. Guy got gunned down, caught stealing. The base running troubles continue. Yeah, it really has. It's kind of been that way for the season, but it hasn't. It's been pretty rough as of late. So lips in a race, two down, and the hitter is Ethan Gross. He takes ball one, low and inside. Gross last time up, struck out, swinging in the third inning, chased a slider after the count had gone full. Christian Coletti just four singles allowed in this ball game. He has two outs in the bottom of the fifth. Gross. Flares this one out to right field, moving over his Robbins. He can't handle it. He drops it, and it rolls toward the fence. Finally picks it up. Gross will slam on the brakes at second base. Robbins looked to have it in his mitt. He was still on the run and just drops it. Looks like that could be the break Wareham needs. The first time they've had a runner at second base. That's an error on Mason Robbins in right. So it's back to the top of the lineup with Gross. Fortunately for him, he gets to second base. Cole Sturgeon now steps in. He had the single to right field in the third inning, and he flew out to center in the first. Second error of the summer for Robbins in right. Fastball is over for strike one to Sturgeon. First time Wareham has had a runner in scoring position. Coletti leans in, gets his sign from Pentecost. Kicks in the 0-1. Rolled over that one, Sturgeon. Ground ball to first. A tailor-made hop to Caressa. And that does it here in the fifth inning. Wareham gets a runner to second, but strands him there. We are through five on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. It's born eight, Wareham nothing. We'll be right back with the sixth. Base in the bottom of the fifth, but nothing to do for it. But Kurt McCune is out there again. It's the top of the sixth inning at Spillane Field. Bourne has an 8-0 lead on the Gateman. Mason Robbins to lead things off for Bourne. It'll be 2-3-4. and four. Mason Robbins, Max Pentecost, and Clint Freeman. Robbins is 2-3 for three and takes a called strike, 0-1. Robbins... Has scored twice, he has a single, that was in the first, a double, that was in the second, and he struck out looking in the fourth. Here's the 0-1. He swings and grounds it foul over by the first base coaching box. Yeah, the error by Robbins in the last half inning was just bizarre. It, it looked like kind of a routine fly ball. He was on the run, but it just popped out of his glove. He, he did have it and got his mitt on it, but next thing you know, it rolls to the fence. He had a little trouble picking it up there, and Gross, Gross rolls into second base. 0-2 pitch, low for ball one, one and two to Mason Robbins. Robbins from Southern Mississippi, teammate of Bradley Roney. One, two, shopper to short Ethan Gross. Throws, it's close play, but it's at number one. Gross so steady over there, handles it easily and gets Robbins for the first out. Now bring up Max Pentecost, catcher from Kennesaw State. He's been on twice. He walked and scored in the first. He singled in the second, and he struck out in the fourth. But in that fourth inning, he fouled one, and it hit third base coach Harvey Shapiro. Good to see that he's okay. As Pentecost hits that one foul way behind us. 
More interesting sound effects here at Spillane. Jeff doing a good job, the shattered glass there. Hopefully that didn't actually shatter any glass on a car. I hope not. A one pitch to Pentecost. Chopper to Ethan Gross again at shortstop. Throw is in time for out number two. Back to back round outs to short. Ethan Gross has been busy. Yeah, it's just like clockwork for him. He, he's so steady over there. Quickly two away, just helping out a pitcher. If, you know, we heard from Fred Shepard yesterday before the game. He said, I have a great defense behind me. I don't need to be striking guys out. If, you know, players are putting balls in play, I have the defense to back me up. We saw that last night with plays made by Adam Toth. And really, Wareham just is a very good defensive team. Here's Clint Freeman. Pair of singles. He scored twice. First pitch is a called strike. Breaking ball in there from Kurt McCune. He was also strikeout victim number one for the LSU right-hander in the second. Down to the count. 0-1 right now. Here's the pitch from McCune. And Freeman swings and misses, so the count's quickly 0-2. And, and McCune flirting with a 1-2-3 inning. Another quick thank you we'd like to give out there. Linda and Jim McKiernan, they do a great job. Always here, go to a ton of road games too. Been a, just another pleasant aspect of, of this summer for everyone. 0-2, foul back. And Linda and Jim run the merchandise stand here at Spillane Field. They've really done a great job. And they're always out there. They're very good with customers and the fans. And They had the merchandise tent set up at the All-Star game. Yep. Linda in charge of the interns, too. Just yep. do a whole lot with this organization and do a great job all the way around. 0-2. Inside, 1-2 and two to Clint Freeman. Still a beautiful day. The clouds have kind of moved away. One, two, as Freeman fouls that one back. And on to the roof of Wareham Middle School. When the season is officially over, or when somebody goes on to the roof, I want to know how many foul balls they find up there. You could go up there. I'm not going up there. Why not? You could come up with a whole lot of baseballs. I, I you could, wanted I, your foul I, balls. Got, That's where you I, could hey, get I them. I got one at the All-Star game. That's where you could get them, I'm telling you. 1-2 to Freeman. That one is inside and gets away from the catcher, Schwarber. 2-2. Two and two. Hey, you, ne you never got a foul ball. I didn't want a foul ball. You sure? Yeah. I mean, you don't go to do you go to Fenway Park and you ever try to get a foul ball or something? Nope. I mean, I did when I was a kid. I'm s we're still kids. Yeah, but I, wish, just, I just don't want them anymore. <laughs> we wish. 2-2 two, two. to Freeman as he fouls that one back. Working up a very good at-bat here against Kurt McCune. Very good battle. I, even if he does end up going down, this is a, a good at bat because Robbins and Pentecost, they grounded out quickly to start the inning for the first two outs. This just extends the inning, makes Kurt McCune have to work a little bit and, and can maybe get deeper into the Gateman bullpen because these teams squaring off again tomorrow. Two and two of the count to Freeman. Here it is from McCune. Foul back right at us. Two other games in progress right now. Harwich leads Brewster 4-3 to three in the bottom of the fourth inning. The Mariners one point behind Orleans for second place in the east. And the YD Red Sox are up 1-0 on Hyannis in the top of the fifth over at Red Wilson Field. We'll hear from Hillary Bushway at the end of this half inning as Freeman fouls that one back. Two and two, the count on Clint Freeman from East Tennessee State. Two, two from McCune in the dirt, stopped by Schwarber. Nice stop. So the count will run full, three and two. A terrific at bat here by Freeman. You know, he had the RBI single earlier, then he struck out. Just putting together a pretty nice day at the plate here as he continues to battle. And see why this guy was an all star. Three two pitch from McCune. High fly ball to deep right. McMullen going back on the warning track. He jumps and he makes the the catch and crashes into the fence. Wow. 
Great play out there by Sean McMullen. Hope he's okay, but looks to be all right coming back to the dugout, but a great catch out there by the right fielder. And now let's send it down to Hillary Bushway. What do you got for us? Thanks, Austin. So thank you for everyone who participated in tonight's trivia question. The correct answer we were looking for was Teddy Regan. Teddy spent his last three years with the Barn Braves and now he's here with us. Now he's here in, in Wareham with us. So this does it for me for the summer, and we want to send it back up to Mike and Austin for some more Wareham Gateman baseball. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you very much, Hillary, and done a great job all season. Very lucky to have you, and good luck back at L1C4 as you get a quick look here at the catch by Sean McMullen. Wow, we get a better look at it right there. Ain't nothing born. We'll be right back on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. Ain't nothing born, but the Braves have a new pitcher. It is Cody Livingston, left-hander from Southern Mississippi. 1-0 with a 4.86 earned run average, nine games, eight out of the bullpen, 20 and a third innings pitch, 22 strikeouts, 14 walks and 18 hits. So he's had some trouble with command. His, his first pitch is a strike to Brett Pirtle. Pirtle again electing to bat left-handed against a lefty pitcher, which he did in the third inning when he grounded out against Coletti. A one pitch, that one is low, one and one. But how about the start by Coletti? Five innings, four hits. He didn't walk anybody. He had three strikeouts. And, you know, talk about putting your team in a position to win. He didn't give up a run, and he just got into town. Yeah, he also got great, great run support. As the 1-1 one, one is a called strike to Pirtle, 1-2. and two. Last appearance for Livingston came on July 30th at YD. Two innings, a run. It was unearned, two hits, no walks, two strikeouts. 1-2, the count to Pirtle. Here it is. Foul off to the left. Livingston pitched against Wareham on the 4th of July. He threw three scoreless innings, three perfect innings. Faced the minimum nine batters. He had six strikeouts. One, two, here's the pitch to Pirtle. Low and away, two and two. To the count here is the pitch to Pirtle from Livingston. Foul back again, so we'll keep on going, two and two. We also want to, want to send a thank you to Scott Eaton. He runs Gateman.org, the website. Puts the stories up, does the audio with the website and player of the game and everything, and he does a really great job. Yeah, so. he's also the, you know, the other arm. Warren has helped us out a lot. Scott has helped us out a lot. Uh, two, two great mentors for us that have just helped us along the way this summer. Yeah, Scott was the first person who introduced me to this team, and very glad that I've had the opportunity here. Three and two is the count to Pirtle as the two-two is dropped right in front of home plate. Eight nothing, Born. Bottom of the sixth there at Spillane Field. Austin Pollock, Mike Monaco to my left, and Hillary Bushway down on the field. Three-two chopper foul over by Daryl Maxwell, the first base coach. Open here from general manager Tom Gay at some point in this game. 3-2 is Pirtle, swings and misses. Ball is dropped by the catcher Pentecost. He throws to first to complete the strikeout. And that's how we start things in the bottom of the sixth. First strikeout for Cody Livingston. There's one away. Just a good pitch there by Livingston to work away to conclude a great battle between those two to start off this inning. I'll bring up the catcher Kyle Schwarber. Schwarber's got a four-game hitting streak. He's now five for 19, entered tonight with that streak at five for 17 as he takes a call strike. He's hitting every game but one. That was the first game of the doubleheader on July 30th against Falmouth. He's got an 0-1 counting as the lefty Livingston. Here's the pitch. That one is ripped into right. It'll fall in front of the right fielder, Mason Robbins. And make that. 
a five game hitting streak for the catcher from Indiana. Just a hard hit ball, he sees the ball so well and, and squares it up really too. And then with all that power, he doesn't even need to get all of it to, to put it in a spot to get down for a hit. Just another hard hit ball by Schwarber. Now bring up Trevor Podratz, he's 0 for 2. Sean McMullen waits on deck. Podrat's first pitch swing fouls it. Just in front of the Wareham dugout and Bradley Roney makes a nice play. Bradley Roney's college teammate on the mound for the Braves right now, Cody Livingston from Southern Mississippi. Livingston has been a good left-handed arm for Bourne this summer. Averages just over a strikeout in inning. Well, one the count here is the pitch to Podrats. That one is outside, one and one. It's a nice day here at Spillane. A lot of people here. Everyone's bright and happy and cheery. Feels like the last day of camp. Yeah, there's going to be a nice end of the season dinner after this one. Thanksgiving dinner coming up after the game for everyone in the organization. Thanksgiving in August, 1-1, one, one, and Podrats checks his swing. He'll check with first base umpire Dan Henry, and he says he did go, so the count will be 1-2. and two. Couldn't hold up there. Livingston has been working all around the plate, but a few times now he's worked some good pitches low and away. Did that to Pirtle for the strikeout, and fools Podrats right there. One and two, the count to the Hawaii first baseman. Here's the pitch from Livingston, upstairs, two and two. Podrat's a guy that crowds the plate. He's been hit nine times this summer. It's tied for the league lead. Very aggressive there. He's got a high on-base percentage because of that. The leader on this Wareham team in the 350s. 2-2. Two, two. Popped up and shallow right. Coming in as Robbins going out as Gilbert. It will be Robbins who makes the catch for out number two. I'm going to bring up Sean McMullen. All right. Yeah, Podrats just gets jammed there. It was a good at bat working against Livingston. There have been some good ones in the inning for Wareham, but again, it comes down to stringing together multiple hits because there aren't a whole lot of power bats on this team. When we've seen them score in bunches, it's because four or five guys in an inning are getting singles and putting together runs. So here is McMullen, made a great catch to end the top of the sixth. Went back and crashed into that right field fence. And that first pitch swing, it's a high fly ball out to right. Mason Robbins going back to the track and in front of the wall, makes the catch for out number three, eight nothing born as we head for the seventh on WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Some truth the now Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV, eight nothing born. And Kurt McEwen is back out there, but we are very pleased to welcome in Tom Gay, President and General Manager of the Wareham Gateman. Tom, how you doing? I've had better days. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm doing fine. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. Actually, good turnout today. Um, you know, could be worse, I guess. It could. Jeff Gardner will lead it off for the Braves. Gardner has been on twice. He walked in the first. He singled and scored in the fifth. First pitch from McCune is swung on and a high fly ball out towards deep center. Cole Sturgeon goes back and makes the catch for out number one. How are you guys doing? We're, we're, been, we're doing great. We're a little, uh, we're feeling sad that the summer's coming yes. to an end. Yeah, yeah, 43rd game here, right? Yeah. Uh, you guys have done a great job. Thank, thank you. Thank you Thanks, for being Tom. here. Thanks for everything you do too. Yeah. Make this whole thing run. Well, there's a lot of people that do that. So as you know, uh, it takes, um, an organization, our organization is up to around 42 people who actively work year round to do this. So that's not counting interns and everybody that comes in for the summertime. So, yeah, pretty wonderful group. We've had a, a great time meeting everyone. 
Yeah, it'll be fun tonight. I mean, tonight's dinner should be a lot of fun. We have all the host families coming, and um, all the organizational people should be there. There's a one-out base hit to left for Mark Laird, and he will slide into second for a one-out double. That's the speed for Mark Laird that we were talking about earlier. Doesn't need a big hit to get around and get to second base. I'll bring up Vinny Sienna from UConn, the third base, when he singled back in the fifth. So, Tom, have you already started looking at uh, maybe who you want to bring in for next summer? Any any changes you're thinking about? Uh, well, as far as players? Uh, players, anything, coaches? Well, I mean, obviously every year you, you go back and you review what, what happened this summer and uh, – Try to fine tune it, make some changes. Yeah, there will be changes. There's no question there's going to be changes. Uh, players, yeah, we already have a good five or six kids that uh, uh, we have talked with and are exploring for next year. Uh, we'll start signing players as early as uh, September 1st. Wow. So Hard to believe that, yeah, just less than a month after the season ends, you're already signing players for next year. Oh, yeah, I mean, by, by October 1st, usually we have the nucleus of our roster all set uh, for the next year. Um, you know, we have, we have people all over the country who are looking at players right now for us. Uh, you probably met Stan Meek when he was here. He's the scouting director for the Marlins, vice president, and uh, he helps us a lot. And, um, Sam Neshelman out in San Diego is doing the West Coast for us. So they're all starting to come in with the information. Do you said they're going to be, you know, you always reevaluate and, and look back on it and what went right, what went wrong. What do you look at this summer and say went right and, and things you want to carry into next summer? Uh, what went right is it's a great group of guys. Uh, we, we haven't had any problems off the field at all this summer, and uh, it, it's been a joy working with all of them. What went wrong, uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, we, we signed some kids on recommendations and they weren't ready to play in the cake. Um, and there isn't a big difference in talent between the kid who's playing on the Cape and maybe the kid who's playing in the NECBL, except uh, our record reflects that we had some kids that probably should have had a year someplace else. So Vinny Siena, you saw just grounded out to shore here, is Trent Gilbert, the second baser from Arizona, is McCune. We'll look back at Mark Laird on second base. I think if you've talked to Cooper, and you guys talk to him almost every night, he'll tell you that this has been a good, hard-working group uh, out here every day for early outs. Um, and, and have tried, and I think have improved as the summer's gone on, but, you know, we, we're just not there. I mean, um, that happens. Yeah, Cooper, I remember the first thing he told me, I think it was June 12th, that game against Chatham, he said, this this team, there's a lot of leadoff hitters. I mean, when you look at it, Tino Lipson, Sturgeon, McMullen, uh, Gross, you, you can just go down. As Trent Gilbert sends one out toward deep left center, nice and catch. Tino Lipson makes the catch and reaches out for out number three, but we'll keep it here and keep on talking with Tom Gay. But uh, yeah, Cooper was telling me he said that this is a lot a guy with guys with the with like the leadoff um, characteristic speed, yeah. but uh, not a lot of extra base hits, and that's really what we've seen this season. I mean, think that's another thing that may have gone wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, we had a couple of guys under contract in, in February and March that we lost to injury, uh, who would have been in the middle of the lineup. Uh, you saw what happened when Kyle came in, Kyle Schwaber. Uh, you know, I think it made a drastic difference in the way we've been playing. So that's it. You need that one or two power hitter in the middle of your lineup to set up everybody else. Uh, you, unfortunately, Cooper's right. We, we have a lot of leadoff hitters, um, but we couldn't push them across the plate. I mean, how many games did we lose by one run, you know? Um, so it's a learning process. And... Uh, you know, I mean, we have to, like I said, we're going to go back and reassess a few things, reassess some of the uh, recommendations we got from some of the college coaches. Um, we'll have to think twice when we take a player from that school now, unfortunately. So, And they know it. I mean, they know the difference between sending a player to the Cape and sending a player to, say, the Valley League. Uh, and not to put down any other league. I'm not saying that. It's just that the competition is, you've seen it all summer, the competition is such here that one or two players in your lineup that don't belong here can make a difference, you know. 
Switching gears a little bit off the field, what what changes do you see coming in the organization or with anything here at the field or anything with housing, any of those things? Um, not, I don't think there's any drastic changes off the field. We're going to try to do some improvements on the field. Um, we're working on, on one project is to get an electronic scoreboard. Uh, we have a potential uh, donor who will share in the cost of that. Um, you know, the sound system is going to get updated again next year. Um, that's every three or four years, the, you know, they get beat up, the speakers out there. So um, those types of things. Uh, of course, we have the new field that's still under, uh, under consideration that, that's probably two or three years away. So. Where is that field? I don't know much about that. Have you heard anything about that, Mike? Uh, it's actually, if you've gone to the YMCA, um, it's directly across the street from the YMCA. Uh, the land behind what is now the Wayham Little League Complex. Um, the designated hitter number 23, Matt Walsh from Franklin Pier. It's a joint effort between the, the Gateman and uh, Make Peace Corporation. So uh, they're in the process of building the new Marriott Conference Center here in Wayham, which will be open next spring, which will be a, a big asset to us too. Danny Rosenbaum just grounded back to the pitcher. Pitcher Livingston went off the mound. The ball was hit close to the first base foul line. And they flipped to the first base. And Tyler Caress for out number one. Here's Matt Walsh. She is 0 for 2. You guys have been up in the box here. It's it's a great place to work, isn't it? It's a lot yeah. of fun. A lot um, of fun. I mean, a lot of work gets done, but it's it's a lot of fun. We try to keep it loose up here. It gets hot up here. It does. <laughs> that is true. Ground ball to the right side of the infield. Trent Gilbert will throw to first for out number two to retire Matt Walsh. Especially hot when you get here and all the the windows are closed. It's just steamy in here. Yeah. A sauna. Well, that's one of the things we're looking at. I mean, it, this building was designed to have a third floor. Uh, that may get done this, this year. And... Um, We'll probably move some of the broadcasters, maybe maybe our broadcasters up there and maybe the scorekeeper or the scoreboard keeper or something up there. But if that happens, we have to put air conditioning in because you would die up there. Yeah. <laughs> Third floor of this, I can imagine. I know Dan Dyes and Larry Fournier um, have been lobbying for the last two years for an air conditioner. I remember. <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> I remember when I first talked to Scott, I said, this is a, the most bizarre question you may ever receive. Is the press box air conditioned? And he said, no. That's all I got, no. <laughs> but I'm someone, I, I certainly don't like the hot weather. But Well, you guys had a good dose of it, though. I mean, yeah, that, we that, did. that couple of weeks there Big in early rate. July. Yeah. Ooh. Lipson gets hit, not happy about it. He, get, he heads down to, to first base. That hurt right in the middle of the back. I think that's the second time he's been hit this season. That one was at Hyannis. I'll bring up the shortstop, Ethan Gross. And this is a guy I want to talk to you about a little bit. Ethan Gross signed on as, with a temporary contract, made the all-star team. I, he's leading the team aside from uh, aside from Kyle Schwarber in hitting. I mean, this, this guy has just really done it all this season. Well, yeah, but Ethan was here last year, and the reason he was under a temp contract was because we had to wait and see where he would go in the draft and whether he would actually be returning. I mean, we do that a lot of times when we have a player who's a junior um, and we think may or may not go into the draft or may not get drafted high enough so they would come um, because you can't, obviously, you can't sign too many kids and, and then have them get drafted and not, you know, not report. So that's what we have done with several players. And Ethan's been an excellent ball player for two years as far as he's steady. He's a great kid. He works hard. So he deserved the All-Star team this year, in my estimation. Another player who signed to a temp contract. Uh, he was signed after, I believe, the first game. And he's, he's really played well. Good, bad, off the bench uh, for Cooper Ferris. That's Cole Stancil. Excellent. Great kid. Put up some good numbers. Um, you know, we'll be looking at probably trying to get him back here next year also. Stancil from St. Leo College. One and two, the count on Ethan Gross, the shortstop from Memphis, and two outs. Tino Lipson on first base. He was hit by a pitch right in the back. Cole's a, Cole was a, uh, 
up here for the uh, open tryout. That's where we first took a look at him. And then uh, when we when we lost a couple of guys, when we needed a bat there, we called him up and he, he was willing to come up thinking that he would only be here a week. So it turned into a whole summer for him. Okay, well, he goes, grounds out to third for out number three. Eight nothing born as he had four the eighth thing on the Cape Cod Baseball Network and WCTV. Tom, thanks thank guys for everything thanks, and for joining us. It's been great. Yep, thanks for a great summer. You got one more game. That's yeah, we do. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll be right back. Back here at Spillane Field. Thanks for tuning in to the Cape Cod Baseball Network final home game of the summer. Thanks to Tom Gay, the general manager of this great organization who just joined us. It's eight to nothing. We're in the top of the eighth inning. The new pitcher is Dylan Ortman, and he fires ball one to Tyler Caressa. We are joined in the booth right now by my soon replacement as that's popped up to the left side. Ethan Gross, the shortstop, ranges back into the shallow outfield grass, puts it away for out number one. As I said, we're joined now by Tucker Simpson, so I'll step aside and give him the headset. Here is Tim Caputo, shortstop from the University of Rhode Island. Does Tuck have his headset on? He does. Tuck, how you doing? How you doing? Great, how are you? I'm all right. Ortman's first pitch he is high. How's your season been? It's been good? Yeah, it's been great. About as great as that pink shirt looks on you. Thank you. <laughs> Called strike to Caputo. We, were, we had uh, Trey Killian up here yesterday. I know he's one of your closer friends on the team. Yeah, he's a clown. Killian's such a clown. 2-0, hard grounder to short, gross on the backhand, throws, and it is in time to get the speedy Tim Caputo. Two quick outs here right, in the top of the eighth. So you earlier, you're going to try giving play-by-play -play a shot? Yeah, you do give it? a shot. Yeah. Right, here you go. Mason Robbins is the hitter. Grandpa Dylan Ortman gets a sign. And the pitch popped up to the left side of the infield. It's going to be close. Rosenbaum gives it a look. It's out of play. Schwarber takes the ball from the umpire, gives it back to Grandpa. Grandpa. Grandpa Ortman, yeah. He's how'd, an old man. How do you get that? How do you get that name? He's just so much older than all the other guys in the bullpen. He just He's a lot more like mentally mature than other guys, too. <laughs> so we call him Grandpa. The pitch, another foul ball straight back. Robbins grounded out to short in the sixth, and he struck out in the fourth. He scored twice. He's got a double and a single. And the pitch down in the dirt. So what's up with this pink shirt over here, AP? Yeah, uh, You know, I don't know. I, I kind of just uh, was sitting in my closet and then figured I'd give, I'd, I'd give it a shot. It's a nice day. Line drive over the head of Ethan Gross at short in the left field. I thought we were trying to go for a frat look today at the ballpark. No, me, not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Two out single for Mason Robbins. His third hit. He's now three for five. And I'll bring up Max Pentecost. You know anything about Max? He's a good hitter. Yeah, a good hitter. I was keeping the chart earlier. Couldn't get anything by him. He's a good dude, too, from Kennesaw State. Have you had the chance to talk to him or meet him or anything like that? Yeah, I, have. I met him in summer ball over at East Cobb and stuff, so he's a good dude. Pretty funny guy, too. You know any, any of these other uh, uh, foreign players, anybody personally? Yeah, Matt Gonzalez. I played with him three summers in a row. He comes from a great family. And we were actually, when I was committed to Georgia Tech, we, uh, we were going to room together, so... He still gives me a hard time every time I see him about not being at Tech with him. <laughs> so what's the most, let's see what happens right here. All right, we can ask. What's what's the best thing about being in the bullpen? I know you were talking about Ryan Riga earlier this season. He would just tell a story and then he'd stop and say, guys, I was kidding. Yeah, yeah. I guess just hearing about everybody's, you know, personal stories, you know, 
that sort of stuff. You always hear, you know, people talk about how, you know, they were the legend in high school and stuff like that. <laughs> but then again, you can't believe, you know, I would say 70% of the stories that get told down there. We had a turtle in the bullpen there for a couple games. We had a snapping turtle. Really? Yeah. When was that? Uh, probably about two weeks ago. Oh, wow. Give it a name or anything like that? Nah. No. Killian let it go, and then the next day he had a rough outing, so he told him that was the reason why he had a rough <laughs> outing. Everyone on this team has a great sense of humor. Makes it fun, though. Makes oh it yeah. makes the summer go by a lot faster. What are you gonna do uh, when you go home before you go back to school? I'm gonna go hunting and fishing. Go. Spend some time out on the boat, and just spend some quality family time. It'll be the first time I've been home without my brother being there in 18, 19 years. So. Your brother's going to play football at uh, Ole Miss, right? Mississippi, Mississippi State. State. Mississippi yep. State. Yeah. He enrolled, I guess it was about four weeks ago, and he's uh, they had their first day of full practice yesterday. Ground ball to Rosenbaum at third. On the Pudrats at first, and that's the inning. Nice job by Tucker Simpson. 8 nothing born as we head for the bottom of the eighth on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WC TV. Austin Pollock here, glad you could join us and thanks for tuning in. A reminder, you can email us, gatemanbroadcasting at gmail.com or tweet at us at Wareham Gateman if you have anything you'd like to say here. As the summer comes to a close, tomorrow the regular season finale over at Doran Park against these Braves. Right now have an eight to zero lead against Wareham. Cody Livingston still on in relief, his third inning on the hill about to begin. Against the leadoff man Cole Sturgeon swings at the first pitch. Grounds it at the first baseman, Caressa, for out number one. Second time, Sturgeon has grounded out to Caressa in this ball game. Did so in his last at bat in the fifth inning. The one away as Brett Pirtle steps in, again choosing to bat left handed. Last time up, Pirtle struck out. He also grounded out to first and popped out to short. Been a slow day offensively for the Gateman. Four hits, excuse me. Five hits on the board for the Gateman, but no runs to show for it as that's a breaking ball over the outside edge for strike one. So Austin, how did how did Tucker Simpson do? He did a very good job. Heard he actually called some plays too. That one hits Brett Pirtle. Second batter hit by a pitch by Livingston here in as many innings. Livingston was hit in the seventh. Pirtle wears that breaking ball off his hip. And a runner aboard for the Gateman with one out. But back to Tucker Simpson. Yeah, I, I learned a lot. He told me that there was a turtle in the bullpen. A pet turtle? Uh, or a just snapping turtle. So just they have pet. not kept it as their pet yet. No. The batter here is Kyle Schwarber. Off speed to start it out from Livingston in there for strike one. But he said that Trey Killian let it go and then had a bad start. So he blamed his bad start on the turtle. Uh, that is pretty remarkable. I have not seen any turtles in the press box. Yeah, well, thank, thank God we haven't seen turtles in the press box. But, yeah, I wish I got out to the bullpen to see the turtle. I wish, wish they told me or something. Talked about my pink shirt. Oh, and to the count on Kyle Schwarber, who singled the right field his last time up. One out and a man at first, the pitch. Fastball with that goes by. Schwarber watches it. It's ball one, just missed. It's quite the nice pink shirt you got. Tucker thank was you. not a fan, though? No, he was. He oh, liked okay. it. Thought it was frat day at the ballpark. <laughs> the one-two pitch. Bounced in the dirt. It gets away from Pentecost. Pirtle scoots up to second and into scoring position for the Gateman. Just the second time tonight, Wareham has had a runner reach second base. Danny Rosenbaum singled and moved up to second in the second inning on a pass ball. This one, I believe, will go as a wild pitch. Charge to Livingston. So Pirtle leads off of second. And the count is two and two on Kyle Schwarber. Here's the pitch. Up and away, it's ball three and the count goes full. Full count on Schwarber. He waits, here's the pitch. It's popped up, that'll go foul back behind us and out of play.
Full count runner at second, one out the pitch. In the hole on the right side, into right field, Pirtle will get held up at third base as a strong throw comes in from Mason Robbins. It was up the line. So a one out single for Kyle Schwarber, his second in as many at bats, and it's runners at the corners for Wareham. And a pinch hitter stepping to the plate, Bradley Roney will hit for Trevor Podrats here in the last of the eighth inning. Bradley Roney's got a lot of power in his bat. We've seen it in batting practice. We, I, saw, I saw at least two home runs in batting practice earlier. He usually hits two or more home runs in batting practice. We just haven't really seen it in a game. So Roney to pinch hit for Podrats, who had been 0 for 3. Roney 6 for 42 on the summer with a double. As he takes strike one, low in the zone. Roney has three RBIs. Last time he was in the lineup as a hitter. In game one of the doubleheader against Falmouth on Tuesday, Roney 0 for 2, two strikeouts, and he was hit by a pitch. The two-way player from Southern Mississippi facing his college teammate as the 0-1 is a fastball across right below the shoulders. It's ball one. Livingston came on in relief of Christian Coletti, making his first appearance of the summer for the Braves, five scoreless innings for the Southpaw. Livingston's 1-1, a high fly ball that's popped up to the left side. That'll get out of play. Roney just missing that one. Almost hit an intern. The Gateman looking to get on the board here against the Braves, who have an 8-0 lead. Bourne scored four times in the first inning and another one in the second inning. They chased Will Corson Carr from the ball game. In that second frame, they got three more in the fifth. The one-two pitch. Breaking ball called strike three. Roney watches it go by. A terrific pitch there from Livingston as he gets a big out number two. Yeah, that is a big out, out right there for Livingston. He needed it because he's got a runner on third base, and you want to end this inning without allowing any runs to score. So now two away, runner still at the corners for Wareham. As the Gatemen try to get on the board, the hitter is Sean McMullen. He had a bloop single in the fourth, flew out to right field, and grounded out to first. First pitch breaking ball off the end of the bat toward the shortstop Caputo, who picks it up and fires on to first in time for the out to retire the side. Livingston strands runners at first and third. The Gatemen again come up empty. It's eight to nothing after eight full at Spillane Field. We will head to the ninth inning on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. A beautiful evening in Wareham, Massachusetts. Born with an eight to nothing lead over the Gateman. Dylan Ortman, the right hander from Auburn back out on the hill, came on in the eighth inning. He relieved Kurt McCune, who went five and two thirds in relief. Ortman in the eighth inning, got a pop out, a ground out, allowed a bloop single, and then got a ground out to close it out. He will face four, five, and six, starting with the designated hitter, Clint Freeman. It's a pair of singles and runs scored in this ball game. First pitch swinging, he pops it up on the infield to the right side, Roney who's in at first base, comes in, makes the grab for a quick first out. Roney replacing Podrats defensively. Podrats was pinch hit for by Roney in the last half inning. Roney's second action at first base defensively this summer. Well, I think Dylan Orman's going to get out of this inning, and then when Wareham comes to bat in the bottom of the ninth, they're going to have to do their best Red Sox impression from the other night. Was it six runs in the bottom of the ninth? Terrific comeback effort. Wareham, like you said, will need one here tonight as Jeff Gardner, the number five hitter, digs in. Flew out to deep center field his last time. He walked his first time up, then flew out to right field and also singled and scored in the fifth inning. Shadows creeping out toward the mound here as the pitch is a fastball high from Ortman for ball one. Ortman throws a two-seam fastball, a slider, and a changeup. Had a good summer here with the Gateman. Slider comes inside and gets the corner for strike two. Ortman last pitched against Katuit. Three innings, gave up one run. He had six strikeouts. That was the best he had looked all summer. One, two, stays up with the fastball, two and two. 
Cooper Ferris was very pleased with Ortman's outing. Dylan himself thought he pitched really well on the hill. It was a great relief appearance for him. Yeah, he's been good lately. 2-2 two -two is popped up. Schwarber gives it a look, but that'll get out of play. Behind the press box there, as you can see, a bunch of youngsters give it a chase. Lucky souvenir. That was lucky, uh, was it last weekend, last Saturday, the All-Star game. Got that foul ball. Got my summer souvenir. The long-awaited one. 2-2 two -two comes inside, and it hits Gardner on the leg. He wears that one, trots on down to first base, and is aboard with a one-out base runner here for the Braves. We're in the top of the ninth inning. Let us know who you think today's Wareham player of the game should be by emailing us, gatemanbroadcasting at gmail.com. You can also tweet at us, at Wareham Gateman, or let us know anything else you'd like to say as well, as this is the final home game for Wareham this summer at Spillane Field. The hitter is Mark Laird, and Ortman's first pitch is a fastball over for strike one. Laird has had a good day today, an infield single in the first, a bunt bid that he was actually gunned down on in the third. He walked and scored in the fifth and doubled his last time up in the seventh. The 0 1 hits sharply into center field. The night continues for Mark Laird, a good one with a one out single up the middle. The center fielder continues to hit. He's now three for four. Yeah, he's been on four times. He also walked in the fifth. So now runners at first and second for Bourne looking to add to this eight to nothing lead. Vinny Siena, the hitter, got a one for three ball game going. Takes a pitch outside for ball one. Siena had a sacrifice fly in the first, popped out in foul ground to first base in the third, an RBI single in the fifth, and a ground out to short. One out. Hit on the ground left side. Rosenbaum dives, but he can't get to it. They will hold up Jeff Gardner at third base. Another single here. Back-to-back -back base knocks for the Braves, and Bourne has the bases loaded. Well, after Gardner was hit by a pitch, I was going to say that it's a good opportunity to get the double play, but the problem is Mark Laird has speed. So anything that was hit on the ground, he would probably be able to beat out. But now you've got the bases loaded with one out, but you can also get a double play with a force at any base, including home. So that's the 14th hit of the ball game for the Braves. Now send Trent Gilbert to the plate. He's 0 for 4. First pitch swing, and he cuts at the fastball and misses strike one. Gilbert, like we said, 0 for 4, but did have an RBI ground out back in the fifth inning. Struck out once in the third. Ortman on in relief of Kurt McCune, and he throws the AL one. It's fouled off the end of the bat. Nice catch made there as it bounced off the middle school. Quickly 0 and 2 on Trent Gilbert, the second baseman from Arizona. That fan just gave the ball back to the bat boy. That's something you see every day. He didn't want the souvenir, apparently. I know his you think loss. that's crazy. His loss. His loss. Ortman sets in the 0-2. That's popped up in to shallow left field. Gross racing out. He makes the catch. Will throw to second. Back in time is Mark Laird. Gross makes the grab for the second out here in the ninth. Yeah, well, Gross just had to throw to second to see if he can get anything. I didn't think he was going to have a play at anything, but never know. So now Tyler Caressa, the number nine hitter, digs into the box. Two for four with an RBI. He had that RBI base hit to left field in the fifth inning. Last time up was in the eighth inning. He was the first batter Dylan Ortman faced. He popped out to shortstop, and Ethan Gross made the catch in shallow left. The first pitch is a fastball over for strike one. Reminder, Wareham back in action tomorrow, 6 o'clock. Join us at 5.45 for the gateway to the game. Ortman kicks and the pitch. Hit weakly off the end of the bat. Gross makes the catch on the soft line drive to end it here in the top of the ninth inning. Bourne leaves the bases loaded as Ortman works out of danger. We will head to the bottom of the ninth inning. Eight to nothing, Bourne leads, and Wareham needs a huge comeback here on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Of the ninth inning, Wareham down to its final three 
out. Bourne leads it eight to nothing here at Spillane Field. Mike Monaco with Austin Pollock on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Six, seven, and eight do up for the Gatemen and a new pitcher on for Bourne. It's the third of the evening. The right-hander, Will Cox, six foot four, 230 pounds, just finished his sophomore season at Mississippi State. Danny Rosenbaum, the batter, and the first pitch from Cox. Sidearm delivery there, it misses low and in for ball one. Rosenbaum singled in the second inning, struck out and then grounded back to the pitcher his last time up. Cox from the stretch comes home, gets the inside corner, it's strike one. Ninth appearance of the summer for Will Cox. A 7.36 ERA in 11 innings, nine runs allowed. Pitched against Katuit on Thursday, a scoreless inning in which he struck out all three Ketteliers that he faced and he got the save in that ball game. Has not appeared against Wareham this summer. The 1-1. One, one. That's over and across. Letter high for strike two to Rosenbaum. Matt Walsh on deck for the Gateman. Trying to mount a comeback effort. No runs, six hits for Wareham. The 1-2 pitch. And Rosenbaum flails at that, strike three. Cox comes into the ball game and first batter he faces, he strikes out. Danny Rosenbaum for out number one. Well, Wareham now down just to the last two outs of the season here at home. So Matt Walsh comes to the plate 0 for 3, flew out to center, grounded out to third and then second base. Tonight's a designated hitter. Cut on and missed at the first pitch. Will Cox this past season for Mississippi State, 18 appearances, four of those were starts, a 2.45 ERA in just under 30 innings. The 0-1 offering is over and gets the outside edge quickly down, 0-2 is Matt Walsh. Tino Lipson on deck, he's the number eight hitter for the Gateman. The 0-2, ground ball hit to third, Sienna goes down, comes up, and fires across for the second out of the inning. And Wareham now one out away from going down to Bourne. Well, see what happens here, but it's been a great season at home. I mean, it's been a lot of fun. Been a lot of fun uh, coming to these games. So the batter will be Tino Lipson, who was hit by a pitch his last time, singled in the fifth inning and struck out in the third. Cox from the stretch comes home and Lipson fouls off the first pitch. Owen won the count on Lipson, the left handed hitter from UC Davis. Overhand delivery there from Cox and it's fouled off 0 2. Cox also. In addition to throwing that sidearm delivery, it's actually a little less than from directly the side. Goes with a more overhand delivery. That was the first time we've seen that tonight. No balls and two strikes. The pitch, that's lifted to the left and it'll get out of play. So the count stays at 0-2. Lipson waves his bat. Wareham down to the last strike. Bourne looking to get back to 500. The pitch from Cox. Lipson tips it foul at a fastball that was outside. Bourne with a win improves to 21 21 and 1. Looking to close it out here. The Gateman would fall to 9 33 and 1. Cox comes set right at the belt. Here's the pitch. Misses low and away, it's ball one. If Lipson can extend this ball game, Ethan Gross would be next. The pitch from Cox runs too far outside as the fastball tails away, two and two. Lipson begins to work his way back. All right-hander looks in at his catcher, Pentecost. Looking to close out this ball game. The pitch. And Lipson just continues to battle, tips it back. 
Gotta like the cleats for uh, for Cox as well. Very similar to to what we saw Brett Pirtle wear all summer. You know, Bretts are like I think with, have like a gray base with the yellow stripes or something, but Cox is like the yellow everything. Here's the two two, swung on and missed strike three. That does it. Will Cox strikes out Tino Lipson to end the ball game. And Bourne comes into Spillane Field and walks out with an 8-0 win over Wareham. The Braves put it together in game one of the home and home. Terrific effort all the way around, Austin. Yeah, it was. I mean, the, the pitching from Kurt McCune was, was really the best. I think it gave his team the best chance to win. Just be after, uh, after what happened with Coil Corson Carr, but... It, it was it, it was a struggle, but not a good way to go out for the end of the season. So that does it here from Spillane Field. We'll step aside, be right back in a moment with the Wareham Rap Post Game Shows. Shoot us an email, gatemanbroadcasting at gmail.com, or tweet at us, at Wareham Gateman, with anything you'd like to let us know. We will not have a player of the game interview coming up in during this post game show. They have to meet with their host families, a, a really great moment for them as this is the final home game of the summer but we do hope to bring you the interview with manager Cooper Ferris so we will be right back on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. Back here on the Wareham Rap Post Game Show I'm Mike Monaco with Austin Pollock to my right up here in the press box at Spillane Field where Wareham just fell to Bourne the Braves take this one 8-0 Bourne knocks out eight, 14 hits rather and Wareham comes away with six. Austin, the offense wasn't there. Bourne's offense, meanwhile, got out rolling five runs after the first two innings. Yeah, I mean, I, I really want to focus on the job done by Christian Coletti. I mean, he was great. We went into this game not knowing much about him, and look what he does. He comes out here and just and just shuts out these Gateman bats. I mean, they were, they were quiet. They couldn't do anything against him. And the same with the relief pitchers. I mean, you talk about Cody Livingston and Will Cox. They came in, and they were just as good. I mean, Wareham couldn't really get anything out of them. I mean, it was... It was tough. I mean, just uh, just six hits. It was it was quiet. Well, let's talk about Christian Coletti a little bit more because, like you said, we didn't know anything about him. This is his first appearance with Bourne. He just got into town. He didn't pitch that much. He had nine starts at UConn, but just one year, a freshman, didn't face any of these Wareham hitters. He comes in five innings, four hits, no walks, no runs, three strikeouts for the left-hander. I mean, he just completely baffled Wareham hitters through those five innings. It's really like this is, he's probably, it's like he says, hey, you don't know much about me. I don't know much about you. I haven't pitched in this league yet. I only threw what I threw at UConn. Let's see what you can hit. And they couldn't do anything with it. I mean, they, they, he was just fooling them all day and got to give him a lot of credit. Wareham, it can't feel good to go out there not knowing anything about this pitcher and not able to really do anything. Yeah, it was a tough go of it for the Gateman bats. They did threaten a few times. Brett Pirtle was on third. Kyle Schwarber was on first in the eighth inning with just one out. But then Bradley Roney struck out looking, and Sean McMullen grounded out to shortstop to end the inning. That was really the best bid Wareham had to score some runs. Came up empty there. And then on the other side, the Bourne offense, man, they just came out rolling against left-handed starter Will Corson Carr. He walked the first battery face, then gave up a single, another walk, a single, a walk, a single. That was the way he started the ball game. The first six born Braves reached to start the game. Four-run first inning for the Braves. They really never looked back. No, they didn't. I mean, they just took off from there. They you started out early, and they abs yeah, you're absolutely right. They didn't look back, and they were really good today. It started... Uh, with the hitting, you talk about Caputo, then Robbins, then Pentecost, then Freeman, then Gardner, then Laird, and it's it's it really was just uh, it just took off, and there was really nowhere to go from there, especially for the Gateman bats. Um, but Bourne just came out hitting, and they entered the game um, primarily probably known for their pitching, but um, yeah, their hitting was just really was. I didn't think they'd score eight runs, uh, but I thought I. Thought, I know they were capable of putting something up, just not eight runs on, what was it, 14 hits. Well, then in the second inning, Corson Carr comes back out on the hill, gets a fly out to start the inning for out number one. Then Mason Robbins rips a double to deep center field. And that was it for Will Corson Carr. Kurt McCune came on, gave up a bloop single, so Robbins came home to score. But McCune settled down, got two outs. He then gave up, his really only blemish was in the fifth inning when he gave up three runs 
on four hits, one runner left on base. Other than that, Kurt McCune stepped in, gave this team a, a real good shot to keep it going if the bats could mount a comeback. He went five and two innings, and he was expecting maybe not even to pitch, maybe to just come in for a few innings, but was rushed into duty when Corson Carr faltered early. Yeah, I mean, uh, Corson Carr, he was not good. It's pretty obvious. We can face it right there. He wasn't his best. Uh, but then you talk about Kurt McCune. He really came in. He gave his team the best chance to win, trying to hold down as many uh, as many of these uh, of these born bats as he could. And um, I'm sorry, but it's just starting to hit me now that this season is over as you see the players now taking photos with their host family. It's kind of a sad day right now, Mike. Well, they have one more game tomorrow. That's we, true. But we can't forget game. that, but tr right, sure, right, in, right here at this field. And, you know, a, a lot of this organization is built on the home game. Not everyone travels to the away games, even when it's as close as Bourne. So, yeah, it, yeah, it is sad. I mean, so let's, yeah. let's reflect a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Forget about the game for a little yeah. bit. Well, what, are, what are your big takeaways from the summer? I mean, you know, I think I was talking about maybe for us. Whatever you want. You know, I think for us it was uh, it was a good opportunity. You know, I think I've got the – I really was able to uh, do what I've wanted to do just ever since I was eight years old, do it in really a professional environment and um, – you know, couldn't have asked for a better broadcast partner. And thanks, man. You too. Uh, it's it's really been a great summer, and and maybe let's reflect a little bit for the parents and the friends and family work listening at home. Uh, give many of them a taste of what life has been here on the Cape and what this organization is all about. What did, what did you encounter with that? We n we both would say this is a top notch organization. I th I don't well obviously we don't know the other nine organizations in the league, but as far as I know, this is the best one in the league. I've obviously that I don't know what the other nine are like, but uh, I, I couldn't be more grateful for the way they've kind of they kind of took us in just in that first home game and I as soon as we got here I knew that you know this is going to be a fun summer but it it just blew by I mean 22 games 23 when you include that pregame that uh the, I'm sorry the the preseason game it just kind of it flew by really I mean it's fun getting here at around 4:30 going on the field watching batting practice um, and then you get to talk, you get to spend time talking with some of the, the people of this organization, whether it's Tom Gay, Sherry Gay, Dan Dias, Tom Crane, who's worked with uh, security, Derek Drinkwater, all these guys, and Warren, especially Warren. It's a lot of fun just doing the prep, and you get to really experience this uh, as if you, it's the professional environment and the professional world. And if we were doing this for a, for a major league team, I mean, you, you get the same feel for it. And... You know, it made you feel good, and it's gonna, you're going to miss it. Yeah, and then that's just one aspect of the organization. Then you talk about the players, the coaches, and for, you know, for the family and friends listening out there, uh, I can't say enough about this group of guys. They were a hardworking bunch all summer. The, the times were tough. That's, that's apparent in the record, and, and everyone recognizes that. But, wow, what a good group of guys. They came out. They worked every day. They were in a good mood. They all got along well. You heard Tom Gay earlier in this game when we had him on. He said, there were just no problems with these guys. I mean, they, they didn't cause any problems for the host families. They came to work every day. They were a fun bunch. Uh, you can't ask for anything more than that, and, and the parents have just done a great job. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you talk about these players, it, it's such a great bunch. I mean, they've got, what, thir 28 players. Some have, some have left. Some have stayed. Some temps we thought were going were gonna to be gone. Some guys uh, who are still here who have stuck around. It's good to see them fight. They set a good example. Really for everybody, fight for the job that maybe you're not favorited to have. And it's something that I went into the season thinking is these players, we're not going to have a very good relationship with them. They're, they spend all the time with the other players. They're really into them, and um, we're kind of just outliers, just kind of walking around and covering the team. But no, that wasn't the case. They really treated us like we were a member of the team ourselves. And especially um, some of the guys I'm looking at right now, they're a, it's a great group of guys, and... Uh, I, I know that it, there's a good possibility that we made friendships along the way and we'll be able to keep those uh, as they enter the next steps of their careers and we enter the next step of ours. Yeah, certainly it's been a great journey this summer. One more game tomorrow just to remind you so we don't lose you on that end. There is another game. Bourne will be hosting this time Wareham over at Doran Park, a short drive here from Spillane Field. Sunday game scheduled to get started at 6 o'clock. Austin and I will have the call beginning with the gateway to the game, the pregame show, starting at about 5.45. So be sure to join us there. But while we continue, just a few more moments to reflect. It doesn't look like we will have any guests on during this postgame show, everyone being tied up with the end of the summer festivities.
But it's just really been a great summer. And, and yeah, the, the team continued to come out here and just grind day in and day out. And I think one of the big things I've noticed is that the team continued to get better even after they were mathematically out of the playoff picture. I mean, some of their best hitting has come in the past few weeks. They've had good starts recently. I mean, you think about Andro Chatur. He had his best start on Thursday when the team was long out of the playoff race. These guys continued to come and continued to improve even after the summer that was long gone from a wins and loss perspective. Yeah, I mean, the, when you talk about Kyle Schwarber, I want, that's a guy I really think of. You think of a guy who is with Team USA. He was here last summer. He's with Team USA. He sees that this team is struggling with just the, I think it was seven wins when he came in. He saw that they are probably just about to be mathematically eliminated, and he still comes. He still doesn't give up. He loves the game so much, and he, he's really just took these guys. All these guys just took him in. Like, he's been with the team all summer, and I'm sure he's had a lot of fun, and you got to give him so much credit um, for what he's done this summer, just coming in here last minute, and um, we've had the chance to talk to him. Great guy. Yeah, had a lot of respect for, for that decision by him to come here and honor his commitment to this team, and, Really, what can you say? It's a great group of guys. They they tried to put it together. It didn't all it wasn't all there on the field, as the record indicates. But but they had a good summer. I think they would tell you that anyway. Yeah, I think they would. I mean, they get to play their favorite. They you get to do, you get to play baseball. This is a thing they love, uh, probably just as much as we love our jobs. But um, they not they they gained a lot out of this. Um, I truly think they probably gained more out of this than I did. Not to say that I didn't gain anything. I gained more this summer than I have in any other experience I've probably been a part of, whether that's at school or other internships, but they've built friendships, as have we. They got so much better uh, working every day, and some of them come from winning teams. I mean, you talk about Brett Pirtle and Jonathan Oler coming from Mississippi State, and that team was in the finals of the College World Series. They could have won it all and been on top of the world you talk about Kyle Schwarber and Will Corson Carr. They were there as well. Kurt McCune, Chris Janea, Sean McMullen. They were all there, and now they come here and they have a losing season. You learn that you're gonna have to, you're gonna lose games. You're gonna have losing seasons, and that's part of baseball. And that's something they had to learn, and it's good that they get it done now. Yeah, great organization, and just a good example of that right now. Terry Thompson, the Wareham pitching coach, is tossing fly balls to one of the youngest bat boys this team has. He's just tossing him fly to little short pop-ups, and the youngster is fielding them and just tossing him back. It's it's just little things like that. It's just a good family atmosphere and a, a loving organization, really. That's, that's something that I was told before I uh, bef before I, w I agreed to come here for the summer. They said, you know, th this is a very, a very close organization, a very close league. I mean, the managers know each other very well. The players play at this with s at school with the players from the other team. Um, and the people with the organization, they you build great relationships, great relationships, and great friendships, and um, and all of that. And then you talk about um, it's very classic baseball. No price for admission. It's nonprofit, and you really show that this this team is built on family, and that's what I felt like we were a part of. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll just conclude this game. Uh, let you know. How it went down, 8 to nothing. Bourne defeated Wareham. The Braves with five runs in the first two innings. They added three more in the fifth. The Wareham bats couldn't get going. Six hits, and they fell. Wareham falls to 9-33-1. Bourne improves to 21-21-1. The Gateman will be looking to get back in the win column, get to double-digit wins on the summer when they, these two teams have a rematch tomorrow over at Doran Park. 6 o'clock start time. Join Austin and myself at 545 for the gateway to the game. We'll be looking forward to that as we conclude our summer. Thanks for joining us tonight. For Austin, for Hillary, for Warren, for all the video interns, I'm Mike saying thanks again, guys, and so long until tomorrow.